I'll turn things over to Professor Mansfield in just a moment, but I have to say it's hard to uh, introduce the subject better than the University of Chicago did in the last lines of the flyer that's on your chairs. This posthumous publication is more than an honor to Delbert Winthrop's memory. It is a gift to partisans of democracy, advocates of justice, and students of Aristotle. So thank you all for joining us today. And without any further ado, Professor Harvey Mansfield. We've got this. Uh, is Diana Schau from Loyola University in Baltimore. Mary Nichols from Baylor University in the great state of Texas. And Paul Ludwig, is a, he's not a professor, he's a tutor at St. John's College in Annapolis. And Mark Blitz from Claremont McKenna in, um, in the great state of California. Uh, so uh, we're gonna talk about um, my late wife's um, book, my late wife Delba Winthrop. Hereafter, let's call her Delba. That's I think what she would have liked, and go for a certain in informality. Uh, a few words of uh, Delba's biography. She was uh, lived from 1945 to 2006. She was born in Chicago of a Jewish family. I think. Jewish family. You know that um, uh, Monty Python joke about the man who said, uh, "I'm not a Jew." But I'm Jewish, <laughs> and, and, and this was uh, Delba's attitude. She was uh, Jewish enough in, in all the things she considered uh, essential to Judaism. <laughs> and, and so uh, and she went to Lakeview High School there, <laughs> in the near north side, Cornell University, where she met uh, Alan Bloom and um, lifelong friend Walter Burns. Um, so, uh, and then she came to Harvard for polishing. That was, um, it would be, there was a kind of, um, um, so, uh, well, and I, I was, you could say slave, uh, uh, slave escape route from, uh, that went from Cornell to Harvard. And there was another one from Cornell to Chicago. So she was in a, in a cohort, which includes, uh, David Epstein here, we'll talk later, um, of those who went from Cornell and got their uh, PhDs in the Harvard government department. And so as, as uh, Bloom once told me, uh, um, Bloom means Alan Bloom. He's always called Bloom. Uh, uh, he, he, said, uh, he said, I make the conversion. And he looked at me and he said, and you do the polishing. <laughs> And so, uh, and, then, and so that's, that's what happened to her. Uh, however, she wrote her a dissertation very much on her own, handed it in in 1974, and uh, uh, we were married in 1978. That's all you're getting from biography. <laughs> so this dissertation is now published by the University of Chicago Press, Every Word Unchanged, A Signal Honor, for a dissertation, a posthumous dissertation, this long delay in publication, she never wanted to publish this. And, and she would give us an excuse, uh, she wanted to learn more Aristotle, which is uh, an infinite uh, task. Uh, that's, that's really putting it off to the Kellens. But um, it, it's really too good to um, let lie um, unnoticed. And, uh, and after some, a uh, lot of thinking on my own and uh, some urging from friends, including uh, uh, Jeff Toulis at the University of Texas, I submitted it to the uh, University of Chicago Press and it sailed through with two rave reviews and, um, and, and um, an enthusiastic support of the um, Chicago Council. So uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the book because uh, I've only got these two copies here, and um, and they I, I think are are said to be uh, available. It begins with a foreword by me, then it has a text, and it has two appendices. Uh, the first appendices it, appendix is called uh, a note on the translation, which uh, might be the first thing that uh, uh, you'd want to read if you uh, acquired this excellent book. Um, uh, because she t there tells uh, for, well, for why 
uh, her, her uh, interpretation it has to be supported by a new translation, and uh, gives a kind of brief discussion of what her aim was altogether in the book. And then, then the second appendix is the translation of book three of Aristotle's Politics. But the text of the book is the interpretation that precedes the translation, which uh, is, is, um, is, is, is cued to each of, uh, the, um, um, of, of the sections that she's translated in the back. So it's divided into, the book is divided into three chapters and 16 sections. The sections discussing, as I say, the sections in Aristotle. So she follows the text very closely. But, but uh, yeah, you have to make the comparison between what she says and, what, and, the, and the, what Aristotle says as the basis of what she says to, uh, to, to work out the, the, your understanding and your view of the correctness of interpretation. Uh, this is a complete interpretation. You have not seen an interpretation until you've seen this. As a, especially as an interpretation of Aristotle, which he treats Aristotle as if he were writing uh, a platonic dialogue with, with that degree of care and exactness in every, um, in every clause, every sentence, and every word, every proper noun is searched for its meaning. Periander is as Greek for all around man. Well, that tells you something about Periander's thesis, according to Delba. Um, Lacedaemon, Lacedaemon, that means shriek god. That's the nature of Sparta. All familiar, these are all, and all the familiar passages to teachers of Aristotle's politics okay, are shown to have deeper layers and to be part of a greater design than we knew before. Her motto is, quote, nothing, meaning nothing in Aristotle, nothing is so obscure that it is not meant to be seen. So. Well, let's go to business. And um, we're not going to have initial statements, but we're going to take up uh, five or six topics. Um, if, 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 uh, we're going to leave time for Q&A at the end. And uh, so... If, uh, if our discussion goes on too long, we'll just stop it in time for that. And, um, so you know, and what, what, but the first topic is, uh, is uh, the whole. That's whole with a W. W-H-O-L-E. Uh, you pick up this book, and Delba starts talking about the whole from its beginning in democracy. Um, not so strange. What do the Democrats especially want? Inclusiveness. Inclusive. Inclusive in what? In a whole. So we're still, we'll st we're, we're still sort of implying a whole, even if not discussing it. So that's what I say. And uh, now uh, we don't have any... Um, order of business, ex, uh, or of, of speakers, uh, except uh, maybe we'll follow the rule of Delba, uh, which is everything is based on assertiveness. <laughs> assertiveness is the essence of politics. So let's start with one of the two assertive ladies. I will never read Aristotle the same again after reading this book. It is simply amazing, and it has... It opens me to multiple meanings in words, not only in names, proper names. Harvey gave us some of those. But just everything is going on at so many different levels in her book. And when Harvey said we would begin with the whole, I was wondering, I saw so many things it could mean. And I was just struck with the Delba's thesis, Delba's book, The Cosmos. <laughs> Well, the whole does mean it's analogous to the cosmos. What kind of world do we live in? Does it form a whole? The whole is also Delba's book, which I think one could begin with to reveal things about the whole. And I also think that Harvey, ha you, Harvey hasn't told you all five 
as he says, are six of his topics. Uh, but I started thinking about them because as soon as I started trying to focus in on one of them, any one of them, not just the first one, on the whole, I very quickly was thinking about all of them. So each of the topics, the others are like men and women, assertiveness, politics and philosophy, esotericism. Each one of them opened me to the whole of Delbert's book, which was somehow pushing us to see the whole. So I was somewhat given all I could suddenly see, having been educated by Delba, somewhat at a loss as to how to begin. But I think the one interesting, um, well, one interesting, every, every line is interesting in this book. But one of the major points about her thesis is that Aristotle is doing metaphysics when he's doing his political inquiry in the politics. There was a bare hint of that in Harvey's talking about the whole. But when Aristotle looks at political life, he explores the question of how, the, how does it all fit together? How are, this, are the parts of the city parts? Just beginning with the question of the Democrats. Uh, the Democrats want something. They will be in opposition to the oligarchs. They also want something. They are in debate. Do the Democrats and the oligarchs can they ever come together and be part of the city? Is there any way in which we, Aristotle, through his political in inquiry, can point us beyond partisan positions to a whole that the city would represent? Now, I'm putting part of Delbus thesis in words that are, are quite common. There's nothing particularly common about what she's doing with them. Uh, it's totally original. But as Aristotle explores the whole of the city, beginning with the democratic position, he is really exploring the whole of the cosmos. And the cosmos, it turns out from Delba's analysis, is only a whole rather than an all, a multiple of uh, distinct units. It's only a whole because the political whole could be a whole. And it's only by studying politics that we could understand what a whole is like. So there's much more to this thesis about the whole, but I think we'll get to it when we come to politics and philosophy. But the, you know, studying politics is really doing philosophy in the highest possible sense. So I think that is one of the main aspects of her thesis that we could explore. Yeah, I guess I want to say a little bit more about uh, the way in which Delba distinguishes a whole from an all. Uh, an all consists of undifferentiated parts, whereas a whole is an articulation of differing parts, a heterogeneous whole. Uh, she has a very nice section where she explores Aristotle's various metaphors for a whole, and sort of plays with the different implications of those metaphors. So she considers the whole as a chorus, the whole as a harmony, uh, and contrasts those metaphors of Aristotle's uh, with the metaphor of the city as a river. Uh, while I'm certainly in general agreement with the thought that she expresses uh, and appreciate its relevance for the task of constitution making, which is where the parts would get assigned, uh, I want to push back a little bit uh, just by on this question of the, the whole and the all, just by pointing out that the United States, while a constitutional people, does begin from the recognition of the all. Uh, and I'm not always sure that when she makes the application to politics, she gives enough to the all. Uh, our founding assertion is that all men are created equal. We are that unique people that takes its identity from a universal truth about universal equality. Our greatest statesman, Abraham Lincoln, used the word all, often and well. And in his voice, it took on tremendous defining power. So just to give you a couple of very quick examples, the Peoria Address, uh, allow all the governed an equal voice in the government and that and that only is self-government. Uh, the Dred Scott speech, where he describes the Declaration as having set up a standard maxim for free society, which should be familiar to all, revered by all, thus augmenting the happiness and value of life to all people of all colors everywhere. Uh, in another short work, he described the principle of liberty to all, a principle that clears the path for all, gives hope to all, by consequence, enterprise and industry to all. Finally, in the second inaugural, uh, calls on a reunified nation to act with charity for all. Now, maybe this just confirms the democratic bias uh, that that is strongly present in the United States. Uh, but I think it's also the case that in each of these passages, the democratic all is not an undifferentiated body. 
Each individual comp composing the all manifest virtues, like enterprise, industry, judgment, charity, contributing to happiness. Uh, interestingly, Lincoln also uses uh, Aristotle's metaphor of the chorus. Uh, at the close of the first inaugural, he speaks of the chorus of the union, a chorus that will again be heard when the better angels of our nature touch the mystic chords of memory. So Lincoln creates something like a whole out of the joint operation of reason and remembrance. And Lincoln calls that political entity a union. Now, I'm not quite sure what, Link what, what Aristotle would say about a union. But for Americans, the union comes first. The Constitution is ordained by the people to form a more perfect union. So in a way, I'm sort of pushing maybe towards the next panel, which is about uh, America and democracy. But I just wonder what the status of the union is and, and whether it's something in between that undifferentiated all uh, and a genuine whole. Yeah, just to push back on the pushback for uh, a second. So um, Delba Winthrop does say a number of times that it's an oligarchic prejudice, I think, to, to believe in these separate forms or that there are distinctions among, among people, that it starts as an oligarchic uh, prejudice and, and then is, is needed somehow to, if we want to create a whole out of an all in, in her sense. Um, I think there is but also... There, but there mm -hmm. is this regular description of the all as somehow just undifferentiated body or a kind of presentation sometimes that democracy, right. uh, what, what, what the whole is acknowledging there is simply the power of body and of uh, the power of the, of the multitude. Which is hard to really believe that any one Democrat would truly think but it's somehow an ideal type of a Democrat that can't make distinctions or refuses yeah. to make distinctions, whereas the oligarch is in the opposite, um, has the opposite problem, so to speak. Um, so uh, I think one of the issues that makes the whole important is that the soul and the regime are neither one completed by nature. Uh, they might get somehow completed according to nature. That's Aristotle's other and more controversial uh, type of nature. But by nature, um, they aren't complete, and they need a regime. Uh, the soul needs a regime uh, to complete it, um, which usually means a, a kind of culture, right? A, a wise Chinese or a moral Frenchman. Well, maybe not a moral <laughs> Frenchman. Um, but children who grow up outside of a political community are feral children, right? We still say things like that. Um, human nature is not like any other nature on earth in that we require education to become fully grown. And that usually means a making or an imposition, usually by other people. So politics is needed to assist nature. Um, without a regime, one nature in the universe goes begging. Uh, and I thought one of the virtues of the book was that it makes that imposition thematic. Um, there's a very stark contrast between human making and what just springs up naturally. And it's kind of kept ever before uh, the reader's mind without abandoning the possibility that somehow the process of becoming fully natured might be just that natural and not just cultural. Um, uh, one of the things at stake, I think, is that if, if each of us is not a whole, then our parts might not get along, right? Our, our sexual nature might suspect that our mental natures were really nothing special, just lording it over them. Um, or our desires for food or alcohol or, or drugs uh, might lead us to a similar uh, conclusion. So uh, that kind of caving in to our desires um, a kind of dissolution of the self, right, prevents us from excelling, right? The professional athlete who can't kick his cocaine habit. Uh, well, I guess cocaine is no longer the drug of choice. Um, so I think part of Winthrop's, Delbo's point is that the soul can't be egalitarian, right? Um, the soul needs to somehow be aristocratic. The most egalitarian progressive would admit that his own soul needs to be aristocratic. He has to listen. His desires have to listen to what his mind uh, is saying. So he accepts part of the oligarchic 
or aristocratic thesis. I mean, would, would you guys accept that? Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, so I, I think besides that, there's a kind of philosophical need for a whole. Uh, without a whole, a part can't be known, right? So we recognize a foot as a foot um, because it's an, or, an organic a kind of tool for the use of a larger system, the body. Um, so you can debate where the foot ends and the ankle begins, but if you have half a foot, you know that's not a foot, right? A half a hand or half a foot is easy to recognize. So if there's no overall whole, then the parts are not really parts. They're kind of undifferentiated bits that we select out and define it. We're talking about this now. We can call it a part, uh, but it's not really a part. So we would do it for purposes of our own, for example, to master that bit of the universe, master nature. Um, so I would push back here. I, I feel like the characteristic the, the way she characterizes um, what she calls uh, mathematical physics or modern science, it, it doesn't have a whole. It doesn't recognize holes. Uh, it's, it's only for mastery. But uh, I think it has to be the case that even if you just want to master nature, you have to know a lot about it to master it. And modern physics seems to know a lot about bodies, right? So, how, how did they get this knowledge? Where did it come from? If there's no hole that they're looking toward, if there's no hermeneutic between a, maybe a, a possible hole and a possible part, and then you, you, know, you, you tinker with one and go back and say, well, maybe that, the hole that I thought wasn't quite the hole, but there's still a hole. It seems like you'd have to be doing that uh, to know anything, to know enough um, to, to even master um, nature. So uh, I think these are some of what's at stake with uh, her treatment of the whole. I'll say a couple of words since <clears throat> a lot of them have been said, of course. Uh, yeah, the question, I mean, one of the things Delbert tries to do is to uh, raise this philosophical question, is there a whole, meaning as opposed to mere randomness or as opposed to a mere agglomeration of things? And the notion is that uh, somehow the philosophic type interested in such a question has something to learn from politics because the political community is the first model or image of the whole, and therefore you have something actually to learn from politics. Uh, one of the difficulties, however, is that <clears throat> for something to, have, to be a whole, it needs an end. And it's very unclear what the end is in politics. It's as if you were to say uh, <clears throat> that a team is a whole, but you didn't realize that victory was the end, <laughs> you would never really know how the parts fit together because you don't know the for what. Uh, so that's another question, of course, that she raises and that needs to be raised. In terms of this question of the relation of parts and wholes, however, there is plenty to learn, I rather agree, in a way, about parts, even apart from the whole. If you again take the example of a team, there's a lot that you can learn just by comparing the parts let's say, the various, uh, the various positions in basketball or football or baseball, somewhat apart from the whole itself. Um, so that's a major reason, in a way, that the question of politics is looked at by Delba so much, together with Aristotle, in terms of the whole, namely what it can teach us uh, philosophically, but without necessarily a conclusion that there is a whole <laughs> or that there is an end in either of these directions. Um, I'll just end with the one or two things I would have liked to have seen more of, um, which would have been a fuller discussion of the types or varieties of holes. There are many types and varieties of holes, teams, faces, <laughs> uh, uh, let's say a string of pearls <laughs> where they're all identical. There are a whole different variety of holes and parts and relation of holes and parts uh, Delba kind of follows uh, Aristotle in, in her argument, but there's a lot outside that argument, I think, that one could raise if one were really raise the question as a whole philosophically and perhaps politically as well. All right. Um, let's move to another topic, which is... Um
uh, the distinction between esoteric and exoteric. So <clears throat> on um, page 69 of her book, um, Delva refers to uh, um, a phrase in the, in the text, Arist Aristotelian text that she translates, exoteric speeches. She says, uh, and says exoteric speeches i.e., not all speeches are exoteric. That's a sample of her reasoning. If you see a phrase like that, <laughs> with reference to something, always pay attention to what is, seems, what is left out of that thing. So, um, and so, in other words, a simple reference to exoteric is also a reference to uh, the possibility of its opposite esoteric. What, what do we want to say on this? Well, this is an extraordinarily esoteric reading. Uh, Del Delpa goes well beyond the usual methods of discerning or elaborating a double teaching. Uh, you know, we are all sort of familiar with some of these methods. A fairly standard route to complexifying an interpretation would be to pick up on a contradiction in an author's statements. Uh, John Locke gives a first formulation of the law of nature in terms of an ought, and then pretty quickly after that, he gives another formulation of the law of nature in terms of a, uh, of a right. Uh, so you've got to figure out which, whether those formulations are compatible or not. If not, why are they both there? Uh, whether one expresses Locke's considered view of the matter or not. But Delba's discovery about Book Three of the Politics is of a quite different kind of doubleness, a much more thoroughgoing doubleness. She presents Aristotle as conducting a dual education of the citizen and the philosopher, where the philosophic education is managed through a schema of equivalences, a kind of enigma code where ordinary language bears a hidden signification. So just to give a couple of examples, she says that when you encounter the word household, uh, it isn't just a reference to the household as seen in the, in the polis, but it also means soul. Uh, or references to the multitude actually means at the metaphysical level the non-human bodies. Uh, references to the few good uh, is uh, a reference to the forms. So on one level, the text is a political inquiry into the dispute between oligarchs and Democrats, their respective claims about justice. But on the coded metaphysical level, Aristotle is ex exploring and critiquing the view of the mathematical philosopher who approaches nature as the homogeneous science of bodies i.e. the multitude, where there are countable ones, each one of whom is an each, which together make up an all, but which do not form an articulated whole. He contrasts that view of nature with an alternative view, which would find in the forms something that transcends naturalistic flux. Delba argues that Aristotle corrects both the mathematical philosopher, who abstracts from quality and intellect, and that, he, that Aristotle is also delivering a critique of the Platonic philosopher who makes the opposite mistake of abstracting from quantity and body. And that Aristotle offers his own more holistic account of the relationship between forms and substance, between intellect and body, between quality and quantity. Uh, his account is that of the political philosopher. In other words, he's sort of showing how you transform the natural philosopher into the political philosopher, the philosopher who begins from politics and explains the rest of nature from that starting point. Uh, and in the course of laying out these, these double educations, the political and the philosophic, Delba finds esoteric significance in nearly every sentence and nearly every name. Now again, uh, I find myself in substantial agreement with her understanding of Aristotle's conception of politics and political philosophy and greatly indebted to many wonderful insights. But I can't shake the feeling that she does at times overreach in the code breaking. So to give uh, an instance, she, she suggests that the name Peloponnesus means dark toil. Uh, an etymology that I, in fact, was not able to confirm, uh, but that further, this meaning, dark toil, refers to the philosopher's toil, which is never made publicly respectable in actual cities. Now, Harvey, in his uh, introduction, both in the book and here today, quotes with approval Delba's line that nothing is so obscure that it is not meant to be found. 
and all of us who have searched the obscurities of our favorite authors and felt the thrill of the occasional discovery can nod in agreement. Nonetheless, I wonder whether it is really the case that Aristotle conducts such a consistently two-tiered education, or that such well-known names as Gorgias, Periander, and Peloponnesus should be imaginatively mined for interpretive gold. Now, I don't want to overstate my reservations about esoteric readings, uh, especially for those of us inclined to look for hidden significance. Uh, it's always good to remind ourselves of the dangers. Uh, and let me just read you a wonderful passage from Flannery O'Connor, uh, who delivers this reminder very well. Uh, here she is meeting with, you, you know this line. No? Uh, OK, so this is Flannery O'Connor. Week before last, I went to Wesleyan and read A Good Man is Hard to Find. After I went to one of the classes where I was asked questions, there were a couple of young teachers there, and one of them, an earnest type, started asking the questions. Miss O'Connor, he said, why was the misfit's hat black? <laughs> I said, most countrymen in Georgia wear black hats. He was pretty disappointed. Then he said, Miss O'Connor, the misfit represents Christ, does he not? He does not, I said. <laughs> he looked crushed. Well, Miss O'Connor, he said, what is the significance of the misfit's hat? I said it was to cover his head. And after that, he left me alone. Now, dis despite my misgivings, um, I, I, I do find it hard to render a verdict uh, on this aspect of Delba's work, uh, because I'm not confident that I've understood it uh, fully and fairly. Uh, and it's always best if understanding precede judgment. Uh, but I, but I, I, do, I do wonder, because uh, sometimes Aristotle seems to carry out these corrections much more forthrightly, as in book two of the politics. So I'm not quite convinced that it, the same thing needs to be carried out so esoterically in book three of the politics. Yeah, unlike maybe the other panelists, I'm, I'm, less, I'm not trying to push back against what Dalva said just yet. I was skeptical at first, but as I kept going, I became more and more persuaded because it all made sense to me finally. Not, well, let me not say all because, what I, as I said before, what I have learned is that every word is loaded and it has multiple meanings. So now I'm, it's very difficult for me to say anything. Uh, but I, it is, let me just to kind of take off from some of Diana's comments. It is true that, that Delba talks about Aristotle's two audiences and that they're two, and two educations, two educations for them. But I don't, I see what's so different from his, re, uh, her reading and other esoteric readings of great books is this. Aristotle is bringing those two educations together. In that very passage where he says that there are two educations and Aristotle is uh, giving both of them at the same time, he says that they both culminate in the human soul, in whatever he teaches us about the human soul. For now, that's a bit oracular, but my point here is that the two educations are not for two separate audiences and teaching them what's wrong with their position. They're that. But when they learn what's wrong with their position, they come together in a way. They do not become identical, but there is a kind of union between them. So that when Aristotle talks about, uh, I think I need another a word, any word, here's another good example of how words have more than one meaning what, that Delbo points me to. When Aristotle talks about the democratic argument, uh, it's are the regimes in that second middle part of book three. One of the regimes is democracy, rule by, first it's ruled by the many, but then it very quickly becomes, or corrected, Aristotle corrects himself too. It becomes ruled by the poor. The word for poor is, sorry about it, but in Greek it is aporos, which means without resources. So you can see why that means poor if you have no resources. It's also the word that Socrates made famous, aporia. Socrates was always being at a loss. And so some of Socrates' dialogues, Plato's dialogues, are, call, are called aporetic, basing the adjective on that name. Delbert sees in the 
those who are claiming to rule because they are poor, although they don't, that's Aristotle's rendition of it, no one would say, I'm without resources, therefore I should rule. They say rather, you know, that we are the majority. We are, we are equal, we are born free, we're equal in birth. Aristotle says poor. He's talking about, well, who are the ones who are at a loss? They are the philosophers, right? They are those who have been influenced by Socrates and uh, who, who doubt that uh, they understand everything. Those who are wealthy with resources, you have another word in Greek, euporos, well provided, they have resources. Who are they? I think they are the ones who think they know everything. They are, as Delva says, they have the answers. It is like those who think they know when in fact they don't know. And so there's an example of how she finds in what Aristotle is saying something that can be true at a number of levels. But when we find out those, whether those who are without resources in the sense of philosophers should rule, when that becomes the question, then her very, his very discussion of democracy becomes much more interesting because she is speaking about philosophers as what, and well, philosophers at the same time as she's speaking about political partisans. Uh, should I just, I mean, I can go on and on about this, but I think what she is saying works. I wouldn't push back because I don't think I understand it all yet, but I'm getting some glimpses of it, which means that it is much more complex than I could have ever conceived on my own in studying Aristotle which makes me very grateful for this book. Uh, well, but I'll stop here, but there's just wonderful things that she does. That I mean, you will have to get this book and read it. If any of you know Aristotle's politics at all, this will be very, as Harvey said in his fall, but eye-opening. Yeah, I think I agree uh, with Diana that some of the lessons learned are better taught exoterically or on the surface of other places in the work, uh, in other places in the politics. Um, but I did find myself being convinced more often than not. Um, and I would also point to the kind of playfulness about mm -hmm. the, the book and its style that we're, we're going to see this through to the end. We're, we're just going to go whole hog on, on this and just see where it uh, leads us. Um, as Harvey Mansfield points out in the foreword, it's very unusual even among esoteric readings, to find one that reads esoterically all of Aristotle's words. That's, that's very unusual. Um, and I noticed that for any given passage, rather than ascending from a standard reading, maybe via its shortcomings or lacunae, uh, Delba usually places her most outrageous, purely symbolic interpretation first and rubs the reader's face in it. So the disbelief is up front and kind of gets dealt with, uh, usually with a couple of choice footnotes that make it harder to deny that, yes, maybe that level was also on Aristotle's mind. Um, only then does she recur to the surface reading to a very commonsensical uh, way of dealing with those, but now in conversation with the metaphysical, uh, esoteric conversation that kind of aids and is aided by uh, the merely exoteric level. Um, and I, I thought this kind of jumping straight to the esoteric meaning uh, had a different feel. Some of my students do it, usually male students, usually when they think they've got something, you know, they, they smell blood, there's, there's blood in the water. Um, this has a very different uh, feel. It's more appreciative, a kind of celebration of Aristotle's ingenuity uh, rather than of her own ingenuity in discovering his. And I would insist there's something feminine about it. Um, sometimes when she's sure we know what she means, she doesn't even talk about the literal meaning. Uh, for example, ta polemica, Aristotle's term for warlike matters, is polemics pretty much throughout the book, um, indicating a kind of dialogic analog to war. So there's a kind of deep insouciance about the procedure, a playfulness. Uh, it, doesn't strike me as the kind of sprezzatura or nonchalance of someone looking to impress. Um, on the contrary, it reminds me of Strauss's dictum about the scholar who never wrote a line without looking over his shoulder. Um, 
Delba clearly does not care who is looking over her shoulder. Um, maybe feeling no need to publish it would be a related fact. Uh, but it seemed to me that she kind of vindicates and enacts her assertion that woman is Aristotle's symbolic stand-in for the philosopher, the man who doesn't assert himself uh, within the city. So just a couple of points. Um, you know, a lot of the interpretation is, uh, is uh, for those who don't know Greek so well, is grounded on her translation, which is extremely literal in the sense of unidiomatic. It's the kind of translation you make for yourself, really, even if you know the language well, in order to <clears throat> make the language, in a certain sense, unfamiliar to you. So I certainly commend the translation of book three, which is what the dissertation's about, um, to you uh, to help you see, and in a certain sense, make more reasonable or less unreasonable, if that's your perspective, um, this mode of interpretation. Uh, the difficulty with esoteric, exoteric interpretation, there are two or three of them. One is, is identifying the audiences. Who are these different audiences to whom one is addressing oneself? Uh, broadly, Delba distinguishes a political and a philosophic audience, but there are times it seems that there are three or even four audiences. So one would really need to break that down a bit. The philosophic audience, that's clear enough. But then it may be that the political scientist is somewhat different from um, a reasonable and reasonably educated political person, somewhat different from someone simply within a city seeking to be more just. So one would need to really break down uh, the variety of audiences uh, to whom these uh, teachings are addressed, but there are certainly two, basically. Um, it's a model of a consistent effort to try to have a double interpretation. It's a piece by piece, step by step. Um, the proof of the pudding is in absolutely every spoonful. Um, and you can learn whether or not you uh, agree with this kind of interpretation uh, very clearly in this, in this way. It's different in a way not in principle, but in, in, the, in the manner in which one would do it a little from the way one goes about one of uh, interpreting one of Plato's dialogues, where the doubleness or tripleness or quadrupleness is clear on the surface in a certain sense to almost everybody. They just can't work it out all the way. Um, this less so, but it's done in this very, very systematic manner. So I'd say the key issue is really uh, uh, being very clear about the audiences that she actually has in mind, especially the variety of the political audiences, I said. The kind of doubleness in turning something political into something more visibly ontological, one might say. That's pretty clear what she's doing. But what's going on politically, uh, one would really need to think through a lot as well. Another <clears throat> topic? Or Distinction has already been mentioned, uh, politics and philosophy. So, uh, and it's already, uh, Mary Nichols already referred to the bringing together of these two. At the end of uh, Delva's book, she speaks of a friendship between politics and philosophy and says that you can make politics friendly to philosophy by making philosophy friendly to politics. And this is... Uh, uh, a way of bringing the two together, um, and, and, and not, and not to uh, put an end to the tension, but to to uh, to resolve it. And um, so, what what else do we want to say on politics and philosophy? I just wanted to clarify one thing for the audience. When we think, sometimes you all have heard, I am sure, of esoteric readings. And, we, and, they, and it's directed to, you could say, sometimes we say the gentleman, sometimes we would refer to the political man uh, as one of the audiences. And I know that varies and, and means different things. And the other is that while the philosopher preserves the city to protect the city, to protect human beings, he also is trying to question opinion to bring potential philosophers to become philosophers, to see the truth. And those are 
a, a kind of way we understand esotericism and the two audiences. Delp has done something really quite different, I believe. There is some of that in her book, but when I say the two, the two educations, one for philosophy and one for political partisans, it's that the philosophers are partisans that she is trying to educate. They need correcting just as much and on a parallel plane to the political partisans. And so the philosophic partisans she is directing herself to are very much like the democratic and oligarchic partisans. She sees theoretical issues underlying, undergirding the democratic position and, and, and so also the oligarchic position. Not that actual Democrats or oligarchs fully understand the ramifications or the assumptions that they are making, for sure. She does make that qualification. Under the democratic position, which is an appeal to equality and understanding in terms of numbers and counting, is a philosophic position. She sometimes calls it materialism, it is ancient corporealism, and it is a kind of <coughs> mathematics that finds alls by counting and that understands a multitude as a combination, as, a, uh, as an all and not a whole. She thinks this philosophic position is one that Aristotle needs to overcome in order to understand the whole, the metaphysical inquiry that is going on in the politics. By the same token, the oligarchic position, she relates to those who believe in or hold to, I think she uses that word, it's better than believe, hold to the forms. And that's Plato, because they emphasize the differences between things, not the homogeneity, as would the Democrats and the atomist, and Hobbes, by the way. She brings in a modern materialist for this purpose as well. But with the oligarchic position and difference, you get the Platonists, those who introduce forms. Neither, it's neither of those positions that fully understand the human soul, according to Aristotle. And so this is quite a different esotericism and appeal to philosophers. He's Aristotle's, I don't know who Aristotle's audience ultimately is, who he really wants to, us, the reader, he wants us to see the corrections he's making when he speaks both to political partisans and to philosophic partisans. So I don't know if that helps in explaining what Delb was doing, which is really quite different, and, I, and that's part of what I've become persuaded by. Yeah, and I, just to continue with the same thought, it's really a battle between two metaphysics rather than the moderns who are non-metaphysical versus the ancients yeah. who are. There's a democratic, materialistic <laughs> metaphysics versus a kind of platonic forms <laughs> metaphysics. And I, I, I find that very challenging, uh, up, kind of overturned my usual yeah. assumptions. Um, metaphysics is the focus of the book, which is very startling. Uh, for a political theorist, uh, it, you just don't do that. Um, uh, or rather, you could say metaphysics got banished centuries ago uh, by Hobbes and others who made it seem foolish. Um, by 1974, uh, one could claim that metaphysics was actually making a comeback, but in an unhealthy way among Delba's competitors. The post-structuralists, the Derrida's and Foucault's, who were committed to there being no hierarchy, no order or whole, uh, sometimes embraced the ontological or epistemological foundations that would justify their particular uh, political commitment. They and their students became increasingly open about the fact that their politics led them to metaphysical commitments, the tail wagging the dog, rather than building up to higher level phenomena of politics uh, from the basic or baseline assumptions. So I think the fascinating thing about Delba's uh, reestablishing the possibility of an ordered whole is that she finds in Aristotle a similar procedure whereby politics is first philosophy, or politics makes metaphysics necessary. Uh, I was going to add uh, one further conciliation that happens. Uh, not only are the partisans of politics and philosophy reconciled after a fashion, uh, but that age-old battle between the poet and the philosopher is revisited. 
Uh, so Aristotle agrees with the adage that poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. Uh, however, he takes issue uh, with the traditional poetic account according to which man is at the mercy of capricious fates and courage is the supreme virtue. So Delba argues that Aristotle is himself a poetic legislator engaged in a largely unseen remaking of whole human beings and whole cities. Uh, both the whole person and the whole city are instances of mixed regimes. They are compounded entities. So one or two things about this, <coughs> this uh, metaphysical or ontological uh, um, direction that Delba takes. <coughs> it's, in a certain sense, uh, more platonic than Aristotelian, uh, in a way, because she follows the text. So there's nothing much really on motion, which is the key to Aristotle's physics and metaphysics, maybe, being at work, um, potential, uh, the actual, there's some on that, or even in a way his uh, theoretical discussion of the soul in, in De Anima. So it's a particular, and we could disagree about that of course, but it's a particular kind of um, metaphysical or ontological discussion very much oriented to this question of is the cosmos a whole, is the political world a whole, but Aristotle's own usual terms of trade in the metaphysics and the physics uh, are, are not actually the focus of this book, despite its, uh, its emphasis on the metaphysics in Aristotle. And I think that might be one reason why she didn't want to publish it, yeah, okay. but that she wanted to do that. Do that. Yeah, I could see yeah, that. Make that uh, reconciliation or something. Yeah. Um, now, uh, that, uh, another topic is uh, assertiveness, assertiveness. Um, Delba says that for Aristotle, um, the word assert is very different from the word say, which is in turn different from the word mention in a, all its meaning. I had a fr friend of hers uh, who said after reading her dissertation that this was a dissertation on the word, the Greek word phemi which means uh, to assert. So what do you think about assertiveness? Well, uh, <laughs> in, in, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. you can't ask the mealy mouth well, well, males well, well, to start. Said, yeah, well, no, but <laughs> no. she says that the woman always gets the last yeah, word, yeah. so. Oh, so yeah. first word we, also. We ought to be last. <laughs> yeah. uh, in, in beginning from politics, uh, Aristotle begins from disputes and assertions, uh, all the raucous claim and counterclaim of political contestation. Uh, Delb was extremely adept uh, at identifying these various speakers and positions in Aristotle's texts. Uh, she shows what the boast of each is, and then also how they can be brought into dialogue with one another. Uh, the fact of, of assertion is linked to man's desire to be free and honored. Uh, assertion is a phenomenon of thumos, uh, the mysterious X factor, that makes it possible to say that politics is natural to human beings. Uh, Delba, following Aristotle, argues, con argues convincingly that we need to take the phenomenon of boasting uh, with its demand for honor and recognition seriously. Uh, boasting indicates that we are more than body. Uh, we aspire to be part of the quality. In exploring these various boasts, uh, Aristotle begins with the boast of freedom, which comes first and is the precondition of any higher claims of virtue. Yet by itself, freedom is fairly empty without content. Choice needs an end or purpose, and therefore some first principle must be authoritative. We need a regime that makes something publicly honorable, thereby turning that thumos, that anger or will, into public spiritedness. Uh, Aristotle provides an education of this manly assertiveness. Uh, moreover, we learn from Delba's attention to assertiveness that the political philosopher engages in assertions of his own. Uh, as in his support for moral virtue. So certain kinds of philosophic assertions are said to be necessary to support noble judgments. I guess I could stay out of this one, really, with assertiveness, <laughs> but I, I agree. I mean, well, it's actually, well, Delba connects assertiveness with freedom, with manliness, and with politics, and it is to her essential to those things. Uh, 
one, it's very interesting, and we could do more with the question that uh, Mark raised about is Delba's interpretation of Aristotle, does it in a way make him platonic in some way in spite of his distinction between Plato and Aristotle? You know, one of the things when you look at Aristotle's parts of the soul, uh, wherever you find them, you never see spiritedness playing such a central part as it does in Plato's Republic. So one might look at Aristotle and say somehow he didn't, he neglected spiritedness. Because uh, it's not, look at the end of book one, or look at the beginning of book six of the ethics, book one of the ethics. There are divisions of the soul, and spiritedness does not come up as part of the soul. What Delba has done is let us, make us rethink this, because spiritedness is so central to what Aristotle is doing. That, of course, means, does, does this mean he does it in the same way Plato does, and he's really learning this from Plato, although, although he doesn't bring it out on the surface? That's possible. Or is he doing something different from what Plato does with spiritedness? Uh, and I think Diana made a very good point when she said that there is a philosophic spiritedness, Arthur Moss, just as there is a political one. Uh, and I, I suspect it's, it, it is manifest for, for Delba's Aristotle in his inquiry or in his writing of the politics uh, because of the bringing together into a whole that Aristotle himself is doing. And what is the whole? Politics and philosophy, esoteric and exoteric speech, men and women. Aristotle is bringing many I, I hesitate saying parts, but with, with many aspects of human life so that we can see them kind of as, together in a way that they're not just all, you can't just start counting these things and think you have anything, because they all impact on the other. We see them as a whole. And it, it's Aristotle doing that for the world he sees and experiences. That's his assertiveness, uh, I believe. Now, Arist uh, Delba argues, and this is one of the things I am still trying to understand fully, that without assertiveness or spiritedness, well, we wouldn't have politics, but also we wouldn't have a whole of any kind. Think of that. Whether it's a human whole, a human being, a city, a political whole, or the cosmos, that that third thing, the third thing, the first two would be body, and the second one would be forms, just to put it in terms of what we talked about before. You could also put it in terms of intellect, which Delba does. It's that which knows the forms. Delba thinks there are two <coughs> possible slaveries that we can experience, slaveries, say, to nature. One is body and one is of mind, and it is... and. It is spiritedness or freedom that brings us beyond those two slaveries, takes mind and body into account, and makes it into a whole. Now, this goes well beyond anything we've said before about parts and wholes. But this, I don't know if I could explain it more than I have, but others might be able to better. I am sure that is her thesis. And that is remarkable, because if we don't understand politics with spiritedness at its core, we will never be able to understand what a whole is like, how it comes about, and whether we live in a cosmos rather than in Hobbes's universe, let's say. Yeah, it's a very radical thesis. Um, you could think that philosophy is just a kind of drinking in, right? A taking into oneself, or a be being receptive, right? of the universe, let the universe come to you, you understand it, you see that it's a whole somehow. And she's saying, no, it will never show itself to you as a whole unless you take a stand and make a, a kind of assertion, a kind of uh, thumoid uh, assertion uh, to make it a whole. Um, and I found myself unsure just how poetic that was. Um, just what, whether it was a fabrication mm -hmm. that Aristotle knows is a fabrication, uh, I, don't, I don't think she ever says that. She wonders about that at a number of places. Um, 
that is to say, is there something ungenuine about it? Or is it uh, really just uh, as stated that um, the nature of things is such that uh, the philosopher has to make a stand in order to see that nature is a whole? Um, on the uh, question Mark brought up about Plato versus Aristotle forms versus Aristotelian metaphysics, I think in the King of Kings uh, chapter, this is the king without law, the Pam Basileia, um, that I think she wants to say that that is Aristotle's dealing with uh, Plato's form of forms, or the form of the good under which all the other forms are subsumed, and his rejection of it, and um, kind of what we know from Aristotle elsewhere, that if there are forms, there they are forms in matter, they're immattered forms and not e uh, existing separately. The, uh, in speech you can articulate them separately. They are something but they're not, uh, they have to go together with matter to make a whole. Um, so I, I thought in a way she did um, uh, find in the politics uh, a metaphysics that was rec recognizably Aristotelian. Well, that could be, I had in mind the fact that, you know, her discussion doesn't include, uh, uh, and in a way you can see why, because she's following Aristotle's text, a discussion of motion, which is so central to Aristotle, or a discussion of being at work, or any of Aristotle's own philosophical uh, terms. Uh, similarly, uh, the discussion of spiritedness is extremely interesting, but there's almost none of it, of course, in book three in Aristotle's politics. So it's a, it's a good example of one of the usual criticisms of an esoteric reading that one makes much of pregnant silences <laughs> because one can go in all sorts of directions that way. Uh, Thumos is not an explicit, to say the least, theme of book three, but it's a fundamental theme in Delba's discussion. What's also interesting, however, is that she doesn't discuss Eros very much. So the other place one would normally look for um, uh, a discussion of an orientation to the beautiful, to the good, to perfection, to improving oneself, to all of those things which are connected to forms and wholes uh, and parts which fit together in various ways. Uh, that's uh, not part of her discussion hardly at all because of this very good discussion of spiritedness and the importance of spiritedness. But I think unless you put the two together, uh, you certainly can't fully understand uh, the philosophic life or its relation to politics or even the political life, which is not simply, and one might argue, not even primarily really a discussion of, uh, of spiritedness. So one has this a very interesting working out of the importance of spiritedness, but maybe with those limits, again, having a lot to do with following the texts, though again, to remind you, there isn't much text to follow about spiritedness, directly speaking, in book three. Directly speaking is not completely speaking, however. Yeah. And that's a defense <laughs> I... by saying I, directly, I, yeah. you implied indirectly. I do. Yeah. Well, let me say a little, just a little bit uh, on assertiveness. Um, <laughs> yeah, just um, uh, since uh, I seem called to the, to the task, um, to, to assert something is to put a little oomph behind it, a little bit of will or willfulness. And uh, the suggestion is always that um, when you assert something, it's because uh, you don't quite have the proof for it. <laughs> and, um, and so, asserting seems to be an, un, an unphilosophical, unphilosophish <laughs> thing to do. Uh, uh, and uh, I think what Delva's trying to do is rescue it uh, from that uh, opprobrium and to f find a kind of a middle position, you could say, between proof and, uh, and willfulness. Willfulness is a claim to honor, it's a demand. To, to be heard, that, that, that's, that's asserting. And, and there's also a, an assertive distinction, um, sort of like, me Tarzan, you Jane, or 
Greeks versus barbarians. And that, I think, was in the Statesman, uh, Plato gives that as an example of, uh, of, 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 of a distinction which is based on, on an assertion. Um, and actually, in that distinction, you can see that, uh, after all, the Greeks uh, were better than the barbarians. But, so there's a little bit of reason behind it. Yeah, but so uh, maybe the philosopher n needs to be able t to make a reasonable claim for humanity, uh, that, that uh, a, a reasonable assertion that uh, isn't quite a proof, but uh, it isn't a surrender either. And, and for moral virtue in particular, mm -hmm. is, what, is what Dova says. Right? Yeah. The philosopher's assertion is on behalf of moral virtue. On behalf of moral virtue, yes, right. Yeah, well, that you could say is exoteric of the political part of the work of the philosopher, but still very important. Now, and then the next one uh, fits right in. Our next topic is men and women in uh, Delba. And uh, so I'll, I'll give you two or three uh, um, statements about women that, are, that occur in, <laughs> in her book uh, on page 49. Uh, women must not inform their spouses that they are cleverer than their spouses. And uh, on page 73, women babble at home about the manly men who protect them and give them something to talk about. And then the last one, uh, already quoted by Diana, women always have the last word. So... What about all that? Yes. Well, not only uh, men and women, but the transgendered make their appearance. Yeah. Uh, so Aristotle uh, may be the first transgendered or intersex philosopher, <laughs> uh, based on uh, what Delba says. Uh, among ordinary folk, there is a gendered division of the virtues, with manly men acquiring and doing the courageous work of body, while women do the household work of guarding with moderation. But a human being in the full sense would need to combine the virtues and be, according to Delba, a marvelous hermaphrodite. Uh, it almost does seem that the new gender-neutral pronouns, I looked them up, uh, Z, Zem, and Zir, uh, they might be appropriate for Aristotle's philosopher. Uh, I'm reminded of the wonderful witticism which dubbed Edith Wharton the male Henry James. <laughs> The joke captures how Wharton and James, as great novelists, could create male and female characters inhabiting either gender. Each novelist transcends his or her cisgender identity. I learned this word too. Cisgender means you're like, I don't know, given or you know, conventional uh, identity. Uh, and transcends it so completely that if one were to guess, one would designate James as the more indirect feminine temperament and Wharton as the more direct and masculine, uh, hence Wharton as the male Henry James. Uh, Aristotle shows how the political philosopher must engage in gender bending or practice gender fluidity. The political philosopher in his relation with political men must have prudence or womanly silence. He must defer to those who rule, allowing them to boast that they rule wisely, when in fact they rule at best through correct opinion, which has been propounded by the seemingly mousy philosopher. As Delba puts it, Achilles needs to be befriended by a silent wife who can tame him without depriving him of public honors. At the same time, however, the philosopher must possess male courage and daring, not only in his audacious quest for truth, but also in his connection to the city. Aristotle's philosopher has learned from the study of politics that he too must assert himself, claiming his share and profiting the city at the same time. If Aristotle intends, as Delba argues, for political men to become more well disposed towards philosophy, then philosophy must demonstrate its friendly feeling toward the city, which it does through its defense of the dignity of political life. Yeah, so um, just a little bit more about Periander, the all-around man. Um, he combines silence with courage in his tyranny. He is a tyrant, but he teaches the other tyrant uh, silent, by silently cutting off the taller growths of wheat, i.e. killing the manly men. So the leveling rule of the tyrant, uh, like the leveling of radical democracy, would not be a regime under which anyone else's virtue 
uh, could flourish, at least not moral virtue. So such a hermaphrodite is admirable in himself, but destroys the whole uh, by ruling it. He completes the whole, uh, or could complete a whole, only if he were being the silent wife who befriends a manly man. My fear about the uh, today's uh, hermaphrodites is that they would have neither <laughs> virtue, right? They would have given up the one that they could have had uh, for one that they can't. Uh, I, I don't uh, disbelieve that there are possibilities, though, uh, of periander's who, who could have both. But even there, it doesn't seem uh, to be good for anyone else. Um, so uh, Delba is thinking through sex roles, but that implies that there's something solid about sex roles, too. Uh, male and female are the first and most natural example of natural forms, right? Uh, substantial forms with occult qualities. Uh, nature makes distinctions or produces kinds. The kinds need each other to form wholes. Uh, in the case of man, the external appearances are deceptive. Uh, the title to rule that prevails in politics book one is muscle or thumos, but the true title is hidden. So mind could easily uh, exist in a less muscular body uh, or especially flourish in a soul without thumos, without indignation. Um, man and woman go together to form a whole. They're important pieces of a household. Uh, the household is more natural than the city, if not still entirely natural. Um, the sexes go together in a way still more obviously natural. They produce a child, a new version of their own species. In the Ethics, uh, Book 8, Aristotle quickly moves past sexual reproduction. Lower animals do that. Uh, humans form households not just for child production, but to supply the means of living. And he says immediately their functions differ. There are different functions for the man and different ones for the woman. Uh, each contributes his peculiar gifts into the common store. So it seems like it's good to have those gifts and to, to be able to put them together somehow. Uh, crucially, man is by nature a coupling animal more than a political animal. Um, marital friendship is said to just be in accordance with nature. It's not by nature. So like Apollos, marriage does not just spring up on its own. It's not natural in that sense. It's natural in the sense that it fulfills our natures. Uh, and here again, uh, this seems to be true only for the most part, right? Uh, it, it doesn't seem like it helped contribute much to fulfilling Socrates' nature, right? And you wouldn't want to reduce Periander to that. Or maybe you would to keep him from squelching everyone else's. Delba also discusses very briefly uh, the incompleteness of, of book one, uh, hence the household and, and the uh, economy, <clears throat> and book two, which he takes as discussions in a certain sense of perfect or impossible regimes. So the question really in book three, is there such a thing as, as the political community, which is at least according to nature or not, which would then really raise the question of, of the putting together of men and women in a certain way. Um, the, the question there is always whether Aristotle is, is nearly as radical as Plato, for whom there's only one virtue, not female virtue and male virtue and kinds of virtue. And Aristotle criticizes Plato for that. Aristotle, in a certain way, takes the side. <clears throat> this is in a dialogue called the Mino, where this comes up explicitly, takes the side of Mino, who makes the very reasonable first statement uh, that the virtues are, in a certain sense, according to function, capacity, uh, activity, and so on. So what does that mean? It means that whatever one would say about the philosopher and the hermaphrodite and so on, um, there's always, nonetheless, uh, a bodily connection and relationship to the soul and to the mind, which is significant in Aristotle's political understanding in a certain way that that's not the case with Plato. Hence, the virtues are not identical, really, male and female. And I don't think, in his judgment, could be made that way, though perhaps philosophically, but that's a different thing already. 
Delba says maybe less about men and women, or at least about women, than these other themes that we are talking about. I mean, you can't, you know, open a page without seeing something about philosophy, politics, or the whole, and there is just so much about assertiveness and its various forms, if only manliness and freedom, which, which of course do come up in, diff in many ways in book three. So I did try to figure out very hard what Delville was trying to say about men and women. And so I, I looked up all the passages in her book, uh, and it, it was uh, very, very interesting. I mean, the periander, uh, first she brings up in, well, again, I'm getting caught in language. Delva's book has three parts, but she doesn't call them parts. There's one, two, and three. And they have no titles, just one, two, and three. Have you done something with that one, Harvey? That's very interesting, right? For someone who does a lot with counting in her book and its inadequacies, she has no titles for them either. But boy, are those titles interesting of those subsections of her chapters. Uh, so she meant, uh, uh, so that, just giving you a, a little overview of her book, because I'm going to talk about the different parts and what she says about women in each of them. In, uh, in the first, uh, and I'm sorry to say parts, I think she, she refused to say parts deliberately because she didn't see the parts fitting together in a whole as if you could count them, one, two, three. Each of the parts, I'm saying parts again, but each of those parts opens itself to the whole. So they're not countable things. It's a different relationship between something less than the whole and the whole. It's almost like you have this bud and it opens up and becomes a flower. I think any of those parts does that for Delba's book, just as any of the themes that Harvey gave us to discuss does that for Delba's book. So in the first part, she mentions perianda, but it's almost in passing because that's not the, the section where Aristotle is talking about those two tyrants. And she does mention his name as overall all around man. That's literally it. Peri is around, and ane, andros is some combination of the nominative and genitive of the, the male, the word for man in the male sense. So uh, she brings up a periander there, and she does explain him there as the marvelous hermaphrodite. That's Delba's phrase. And she explains it in one way there. It's because what he perceives by intellect namely cut off the highest pieces of your corn, uh, he was able to convey by his silence, just the picture, no words, to the tyrant Thrasybulus who had asked him about what he, what he should do to, to rule his city. And so he's combining womanly silence and male intellect uh, in, in this. And that's why she gets hermaphrodite out of that. But when we get to the second part of her book, uh, where she discusses periander, because it comes up in that section, uh, and she mentions again that it means all around, around man, uh, and then there's a different explanation of why he's a hermaphrodite. It's because he is courageous as a man, I guess in knocking off the tops of corns, uh, of the corn stalks, I guess that's courage, uh, Although I think Delba has to be joking there. I don't think she sees that as very courageous. Those corns aren't even fighting back, after all. <laughs> uh, and the other is the silence as a woman. And what happens then to Periander's intellect if he's all around man? It drops out of her explanation of hermaphrodite. So Delba, Delba you just have to keep following the argument. It's like, it's like what she understands as Aristotle's argument. It is dialectic throughout. So she mentions one thing, and it's, it's there, periander, but we don't know enough about it. And the next time she mentions it, it's a much fuller account, and she relates it to other things going on at that point in book three, you know, like the Argus and ostracism and, and other things part of that discussion, which she does a terrific job with, by the way. Uh, and yeah. so what... what it, the womanly virtue, though, she tells us, it turns out, 
just, just uh, is not silence. There are different ways of saying what the virtue is. It has to be corrected. It's not like, it, that's, the, that's the mistake. I mean, that's Ajax's mistake. The wo woman, he says to his wife's slave, you know, uh, silence is a woman's cosmos, ornament, or grace, it is, as it is sometimes translated. But when Dalva talks about it, as it gets, the, Ajax to the contrary here, the woman's virtue that Aristotle, when Aristotle incorporates it into his hermaphroditism, it becomes discretion. At another point, it becomes whispering. He learns in the, this from, to, to speak in an unmanly way to men from the woman. And that makes it a little more complicated as to what he means. He does not like Periandra at all, I am sure. Periandra is not his model of an all-around man who must to be an all-around man, it turns out, has to in some way be a womanish man, and that's not through silence. That's periander. Periander combines opposites in an unsatisfactory way for Aristotle. Aristotle will combine the male and the female in a way that can explain his writing this work and can explain his speech. Now, while there is, just to fill in the picture of Delva's book as a whole, she has this remarkable line about the last word goes to the woman. And I may be misquoting it, something like that. Uh, and it is in part two. Uh, after part two, that is part three, she, she barely mentions the word either female or woman anywhere in part three. My quick word search has found. Women, woman's already there. You don't have to mention her. There's the author. Well, by that I mean two things. One, I mean Aristotle, and two, I mean Delba. And so things remain. At, they don't have to all be on the surface. Delba and Aristotle have shown us. And he still, everything he does from there on and maybe throughout, Aristotle does, is based on his bringing together these two forms of the human species into a way that he captures as a whole in his writing this politics. Okay, I'll stop there. Oh, just one other cute little thing about the book, though. Uh, section two of part two has a wonderful title. It's called, From the Point of View of a Man, or From the Male Point of View, something? Man's Point of View. The Man's Point of View. So I found that. I thought that was uh, interesting, and I kept looking through the, the other titles for the subsections. I was looking for the woman's point of view. Then I realized it's the point of view of the book as a whole. But he does make that statement that uh, Delba makes the statement that, w that w the woman gets the last word in that part too. But there's nothing in the text of Aristotle's, of that part of the politics which he's talking about, that would explain that. So Delba, that, that is some of the playfulness that Paul talked about that we see in Dalva's book, but it kind of spells out exactly how it's happening. But it's not mere playfulness, because you really do have to put together different things to, ha you have to have a heterogeneous whole. And Aristotle is illustrating it by his deeds and writing this work, as is Delva, and she is aware of that. And I do think, by the way, contrary to what Gail, you know, she doesn't say much about Eros, but it's there. Delba knows it's absolutely necessary for there to be a whole, but it has to be corrected by spiritedness. And so that very correction implies that which is being corrected, which is an er erotic understanding of the world, which would mean a slavery to the forms or to intellect that she talks about. Eros is there to be corrected. And the correction will come through a kind of spiritedness. Well, um, we had one more uh, theme or topic, but it's also time for Q&A. The last topic was to be democracy. After all, this is a book about democracy. Um, should, uh, what do you want? Let's have a view of the hall. Do you want to ask questions, or do you want to hear uh, something very quick about democracy? Yours is silent as women. Uh, all right, let's uh, let's have a little. Uh, keep it short. Yeah.
about about democracy? Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> Um, Delpa turns to uh, Tocqueville at a couple of places, uh, and she presents uh, Aristotle as like Tocqueville, uh, an improvement-minded friend of democracy. Um, his defense of democracy, however, entails a rejection of the modern argument for democracy. Uh, it turns out that modern ar argument for democracy is not so modern at all, uh, because some of the pre-Socratics had the same apolitical understanding of nature as, say, Hobbes did. Uh, Aristotle reveals the insufficiency of that understanding, the reductionistic, materialistic understanding, uh, and sketches an alternative. Um, just as he critiques mathematical physics, uh, Aristotle is similarly critical of reliance on the gods or religion, and this is something that Delba turns to towards the end of the book. Uh, that cannot provide a standard for political justice. Delba writes, God's thumos or will must be shown to be unnecessary, not to say impossible. Thus, Aristotle has argued that nature is eternal and that it is ruled by laws of which its parts are the cause. God was neither creator nor legislator. That's all a quote. So it seems as if the philosopher replaces the divine. Uh, again, another uh, quote from Delbo, the efficient cause of forms is philosophic eros and thumos, and the final cause is nous. Let me give you just one more quote, and then I want to put my question. Uh, another quote from the last couple of pages of the book. There are forms because there are bodies, and we are able to posit forms through the passions which we owe to our having bodies. Just as man uses his bestial qualities, bestial qualities to transcend his bestiality, we use our visible perception of variety and multiplicity to awaken our intellects, bringing intellect into being. The whole is its parts, yet the whole as a whole and the cause of its being a whole are known only by the man who, by using the parts of the whole, has come to be outside of it as its first cause. Now, whatever else it is, that is not an understanding which is compatible with Christianity. Uh, at the very end of Delba's book, in the last two paragraphs, she makes some highly suggestive remarks about the effects of Christianity on the modern formulators of democracy. She holds Christianity responsible for making certain types of arguments publicly impossible, and as a result, the best defense of democracy, democracy as mixed regime, has come to be publicly forgotten. So it would seem that the recovery of Aristotle, she writes to prompt, is only possible on a post-Christian basis. And I wonder how that accords with her view that Tocqueville is an Aristotle for our time. Uh, Tocqueville seems much more receptive to Christianity's role in formulating or originating the democratic revolution, uh, which Tocqueville understands is directed more at equality than liberty. Uh, and Tocqueville also seems more impressed by Christianity's corrective effect in providing the transcendence and moral high toning that democracy needs if it's to avoid a collapse into nothing more than economics and materialism. Uh, so I'm just sort of wondering, can, uh, can the neo-Thomists and the neo-Aristotelians work together in rescuing democracy or, or not? Well, Harvey's uh, prompt was ancient and modern democracy. And so uh, I don't think he meant Athens in so, except insofar as Aristotle uses it in his politics to explain uh, democracy. I think ancient democracy could refer then to the democracy that Aristotle criticizes in book three. Uh, and then another ancient democracy would be the one that emerges from Aristotle's reform. That too, we, could, we, we would call it is an Aristotelian democracy, not, an, not simply an ancient democracy. What would that look like? I think it would look like, well, we could call it Aristotle. Uh, Delba says when, at one point, uh, a, refers to Aristotle's democratically mixed regime. It is mixed, and it's, it, is, it is a mixture, be, and it's democratic because it is mixed not only of bodies, but it's mixed of men. And in this sense, I think we mean human beings, not just the male variety, because it wouldn't work with just the male variety from Delba's analysis. So, this would be another democracy. Then when we look at modern democracy, maybe as it understands itself as opposed to how it works in practice, 
that would be a kind of Hobbesian democracy that is based on bodies and based on materialism and is based on counting. Uh, that is what Aristotle would like to reform. I think he is using Tocqueville, I mean, Delbe is using Tocqueville in some way to point to what kind of reforms Aristotle would, that would, that would be Aristotelian for our liberal democracy. In other words, our, if our liberal democracy is based on the principles of Hobbes, it is not really, from, I would speak, elaborating what I think Delbe would say, it's not really a liberal democracy. In fact, it's a slavish democracy. Aristotle would like to make it a liberal democracy. And what would that mean? It would mean reforming it in the direction of his own democracy. Uh, and I think Tocqueville would be a good guide to that. And it would be introducing forms into multitudes. I mean, having a kind of heterogeneous whole, which Hobbesian democracy does not. So democracy goes with the bad Hobbesian metaphysics. Um, on the other hand, democracy is the only regime in which the majority of people make up the regime. So in the monarchical and aristocratic holes, those are holes that exclude most of the people. So only a democracy tempered by the assertion of distinctions forms, like Mary is saying, would have a hope of being truly a whole. Um, uh, some, somehow we need a democracy that leaves room for distinctions. And the question is, is whether we have that or not. Um, just a, a funny note on um, Diana's very serious question about Christianity. In uh, Thursday's Washington Post, Fareed Zakaria lamented the loss of the WASP aristocracy and its noblesse oblige personified by George H.W. Bush. Uh, and he noted, among other things, that meritocracy is a poor substitute for aristocracy because meritocrats believe they've earned their high position in society. Aristocrats uh, are aware of their privilege and its chanciness, and they feel obliged to pay society back in the best case, or at least hold themselves to a code of conduct uh, to preserve their standing. And if that were not enough, and as though to say Christian Aristotelianism should not be overlooked, the article next door to it on the op-ed page argued that churches in order to combat the cruelty of the internet age and the casual ease with which we are cruel on social media, churches need to revive the notion of hell as the punishment for cruelty, <laughs> or at least revive purgatory. So I'll take this in a slightly different direction. Uh, <clears throat> Aristotle's uh, discussion is obviously a useful corrective to, uh, to modern democracy, but there's plenty in modern democracy that's not in Aristotle, and that one wouldn't want to give up, I think, very quickly, and that might well be a corrective to Aristotle. First is the modern overcoming of slavery. Where's that in Aristotle's discussion? Uh, second, there's individual freedom, not only as asserted, but as a right, as inviolable, modern natural rights, connected, obviously, to the overcoming of slavery. Um, third, there's the material growth and the overcoming of certain natural limits which most are happy to see overcome. Short lives, bad communication, bad transportation. You can go through the list, not in Aristotle. Uh, fourth, there are various democratic virtues, which you don't see really discussed much, at least in the portions of uh, the work that Delb is discussing. Um, and then fifth, there's the democratic, you might say, invention, liberal democratic invention, but nonetheless modern democratic invention of a useful kind of spiritedness, which you don't see in the limited politics uh, of, of the classical world. I have in mind entrepreneurship, all of these mini empires that people are allowed to uh, healthily engage in so that the taller stalks can remain pretty tall if not wildly tall. Uh, so those are a bunch of words in favor of modern democracy, which Aristotle would have to answer. And you'd have to dig pretty deep and subtly if you wanted to make the case that anything good in those things is already there in Aristotle. Good. Thank you. And uh, now I, we have 
time for questions. And perhaps capacity for answers, we'll see. Um, oh, thank you, everyone. Uh, that was very, very interesting. Um, I was hoping you would uh, say a little bit about, uh, or a little bit more, sorry, about the connection between philosophy and politics, as, uh, as Delba understood it. Um, I think I heard some different answers. Um, uh, <clears throat> Professor Nichols suggested, I think, that that they were kind of necessarily connected, in her view, that uh, that philosophy was in some basic sense political. I think uh, um, Mr. Ludwig uh, suggested maybe something similar to that. Um, maybe politics is first philosophy, or the philosophy about the first things. Um, but then Professor Blitz, I think, suggested something along the lines of that politics is our first window into the into the whole, or something like that. Um, so I was wondering if does she, does she make it clear in the book that that there's something essential about essentially political about philosophy? Yeah, yeah. That the aim of the dual education uh, is to affect, is to eventually be able to bring together the citizen and the philosopher. Uh, Mary Mary made that point, uh, but each has to be sort of corrected separately before they can be brought together. So the gaze of political men uh, is turned towards metaphysics, or at least to goods that are beyond, uh, you know, beyond wealth, uh, to things like uh, wisdom and, and friendship. Uh, at the same time, the gaze of the natural philosophers is turned toward political philosophy. So political philosophy, as uh, Delba explains it, is not just philosophy that becomes politics. Uh, in order to protect the philosophic way of life against the city. The redirection to politics is not purely defensive, right? as if Aristotle is just trying to make sure that he doesn't meet the same fate that, that Socrates met. Uh, rather, philosophers are taught that they must take politics seriously for the sake of their own learning about genuine wholes. So philosophy has to be transformed into political philosophy in order to pursue its own aim of truth. Uh, and Delba claims that it is in political life that the first cause and substance of things becomes manifest, uh, and that, that that is the real theme of, of book three. Uh, thank you. If you could uh, delve into a little bit more about the assert, uh, assert, assertion, because it seems like it's a metaphor to be, but many other philosophers, and I wouldn't pretend to, to dispute you, all of you, but Descartes, I think, that I know, I judge, I understand, I live a good life. I mean, why assert? That could be the room for a lot of very abusive behavior. There are a lot of people who create false assertions, much less boorish behavior. So why assert? It's, it's not just uh, asserting to be, but to be free, for one thing, and to be a whole, which means to make yourself a whole by that assertion and the whole that you make yourself would have to be comprised of body and intellect, as well as that cause of the whole, which is your assertion. So I don't think this is like Descartes at all for that reason, because it goes well beyond just being. It gives really a, a particular content of that being. Of course, you could say know what, intellect on what, but it, it, it's, it has to be intellect and mind is part of that, and it's connected to body. You know, I mean, there's another uh, question that kind of reminds me of this, but I'm, I think that Paul is correct when he said that for Delba, politics is first philosophy. Y'all do know what that refers to. In, there's no word metaphysics in Aristotle. It's just the name that was given to the book. But Aristotle does call the book the me that we call the metaphysics, he says it's first philosophy. So it's quite radical for... Delva to imply, and I think she absolutely does, as Paul points out, that the politics is first philosophy. Well then, what about Aristotle's metaphysics? Have you ever, I mean, what comes to be for Aristotle's metaphysics if Delba is right about this? Aristotle did write a metaphysics, and he did write a physics. You can bring it up with regard to the physics, too. If, indeed, political science, as Delva says, is the model, the only model for any science, or for natural science, well, what about natural science? What about his own metaphysics? 
You could look at Aristotle's works and say he wrote these other, other works. Therefore, is he not refuted? Is Delva's thesis not refuted by Aristotle's own deeds, the facts of those works? Or do we have to understand, which I think we do, the physics and the metaphysics in a completely different way than we have ever understood them before? We have to understand them as written by a political scientist. And doesn't she attach the word poetry to the Well, poetry, yeah, but that words, goes she back. Says that we those, have, those are poetry. It, you know, it, if she, assertion she and self-assertion are, are connected to a necessary truth about human beings, spiritedness, then you will find it in other thinkers, and I think you do find it in other thinkers. It's not the particular property of Aristotle. The question would be how one understands or interprets this particular phenomenon but if it's a true phenomenon, you'll find it in the other thinkers, and I would say you do find it in the other thinkers. In terms of this philosophy politics question, the usual teaching is there's, there's a break or a gap between Aristotle's political and ethical works, right, that he tries to zone them off or close them off from the physics and the first philosophy, the metaphysics, and the other works. And clearly one of Delba's arguments is that there's a closer relationship, particularly because of this question of what is a whole or what makes a whole, which you learn uh, especially and first of all uh, by looking at politics, but also because other things she wants to argue, which were brought up about democracy and bodies and the natural philosophic understanding that we call the pre-Socratic understanding often uh, of, of, of what's not there in terms of form. So there's a closer relationship which one then begins to notice. That would be, I think, the, the argument. It would be nice to know how uh, Delba would distinguish Aristotelian assertion from, say, Nietzschean right. assertion. Right? Nietzsche also thought that each human being only seems to be a whole. Uh, he's really a set of drives, an aggregate of drives that somehow got into step. Maybe one of them mastered the others. Right? Who's doing the asserting there? Right? Who, who are we? Right? His assertion some is in some way a step away from the natural, right? From merely letting the natural come to us, show itself to us. It's somehow an imposition of poetry. Well, I mean, Nietzsche would not say that assertion connects body and mind and makes it into a whole. I'm sure there are people who know Nietzsche better than I here. Well, <clears throat> the truth of things is the, is the assertion of drives. Drives are historical. So really well, what you are is the recreation of history again and again. It's as far away as you can get, but you can never get 100% away from the natural simply, or natural assertiveness. But it's not just Nietzsche and Plato, Aristotle at one end. I think it's, you see it throughout. You see it in Hegel. You see it in all the thinkers in some way or other. So I agree with that. Yeah, but I think Delva would say there's something really unique about Aristotle in the history of Western thought and that he is able to address the other thinkers, especially because they are things they have in common, but he has something to teach them. A couple of you started to get into this in response to the last category, democracy. I was just wondering what you, what you could all say you think would be one or two high points of an Aristotelian reform of modern American democracy. You, they could, but that's the topic of the next panel. <laughs> <laughs> so um, maybe we better. So, so we're right. not All right. So we're not All right. We'll be in the audience. All right. Thank you. Um, very f fascinating discussion about a book that just seems uh, quite, quite intriguing. And uh, I was wondering, uh, a lot of the discussion of politics and philosophy sounds uh, like the assertion that uh, Aristotle is really much more like Plato and Socrates than one might think. In other words, that a lot of the discussion about the importance of political philosophy sounds, to me at least, from what I've heard, uh, like the description of Socrates' second sailing and his looking at the human things and that being the way into the question rather than the method of the pre-Socratics. So I was wondering, does Delba do, uh, compare or contrast this approach that uh, she finds in Aristotle with the, you know, typical Platonic uh, Socratic understanding. You know, she discusses the forms and Plato's uh, and Aristotle's criticism or the 
typical view of Aristotle's criticism of, of the forms. <clears throat> but in many ways, I agree with, uh, with what you said, that especially when you look at the things she chooses to talk about. Though again, you know, she's following the text of Book 3, but of course she chose to follow the text of Book 3. Um, uh, many of the characteristic elements of Aristotle's philosophical understanding, that, you know, I named some of those names, are not really a major part uh, of her discussion. Um, she doesn't r refer back to the way Aristotle in various places appears to refer back to even uh, Plato's discussion of the regimes, <coughs> or Plato's discussion in particular of the statesmen, which Aristotle seems, seems to have in mind, or his particular criticisms of them. So I would say that on the whole, looking at it from, again, you might say a, an academic point of view or a scholarly point of view, um, there's a lot in the book which is, brings Plato and Aristotle together more than I think a, 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 a usual, at least usual for then argument might have been. That would be my view. Let me just say, Delva has set up Plato as, and let me say, I would say Platonism rather than Plato, because there, there's another, there's a jump between those things. But he has set up Platonism as one of the poles he's arguing against philosophically, along with the uh, atomist or the corporealist. And he's using Plato for his own purposes to set up this. Plato, he associates with the oligarchic position as something that undergirds it because of its emphasis on the forms. But what he, Aristotle doesn't do is explore how Socrates himself spent most of his, you know, philosophic career trying to know himself, at least by his own understanding. And so there, this is attempt to, an attempt towards self-knowledge. When he takes the forms out of the context of the Socratic dialogue, Aristotle, you don't get this pursuit of self-knowledge anymore. You get things that would be, that the, that would, the mind would, would grasp, it would be kind of slavery, no room for the self and the self-questioning and the freedom. And so ultimately, I think he is more similar to Plato than not, but not to the Plato, he's, Platonism he sets up for his discussion, which serves his purposes very well and reveal, he's totally justified in Aristotle in doing this, I think, because it serves his purposes so well in teaching us. He wants to teach us about the nature of things. He doesn't want to teach us about Plato. I'm sure you all know the answer to this question, um, but please indulge me. Um, uh, Professor Schaub, I believe you said that um, Christianity made one of the great uh, arguments for democracy impossible, that is, um, uh, supporting it as a mixed regime. Why, why exactly is that? Uh, well, you'll have to read Delba's book to find out why, why that is. Um, Yes, yeah, she says that certain kinds of uh, yeah that certain kinds of arguments are no longer no longer possible. I, I guess because of the, uh, I mean she she connects it she connects it with God somehow being tyrannical and God taking on bodily form, <coughs> and that that means you can no longer talk about a certain kind of human excellence in the same way that Aristotle could, I guess. The unmoved mover allows for human freedom in a way in a that, way that uh, the biblical God maybe yes, does not. Doesn't. I've been trying to follow this um, unconventional view of the relationship between politics and philosophy, and I had this question about it. Um, Aristotle doesn't think human beings are the only political animals. There are other political animals. And he, or at least that's what he says. Um, and he also is obviously aware that a lot of people do not live in polis. And so I'm wondering, I assume he doesn't have anything to teach the non-human political animals. But I do wonder whether he has anything, does he believe that his, his, his discussion is capable of teaching uh, people who don't live in polis, if they at least happen to read his book, or is or is, is living in a polis a necessary precondition of being taught by the teaching uh, in in the politics? Well, let me say two things. The other animals, there there's some other animals that are social, <clears throat> but they don't talk. 
and they don't choose and they don't uh, deliberate about what's just and good. So they're not really political in his sense. But, but, but you know, that, that would be the, the uh, in terms of sure, uh, other political communities have lots to learn from Aristotle. So to disobey and, and, and talk for a second about that question, and this, this will be the theme, right, of the, second, of the second panel, there's plenty that you could learn about our big modern democracy by looking at Aristotle. You might emphasize the liberal part of liberal democracy in thinking about it. You might emphasize the ground of democracy always still in individual assertion of freedom rather than a kind of group assertion of freedom. So the size uh, as such uh, can be useful in some ways, can be an impediment in other ways, but if it's true, but the basic truths about the political regimes and the grounds of politics uh, are there in the city, so even if you don't live in a city, there's, there's plenty to learn, and his argument isn't dependent on his being in the city. He knew of, of lots of other places, empires as well also. Hello, Ryan Schinkel, St. John's College. Uh, my question is what prof the late Professor Winthrop uh, used of uh, Thumos and Aristotle since it is uh, only three times mentioned in the ethics and uh, as a word and only one page is given to it in the politics um, uh, in terms of the Greeks being the middle between spiritedness and reason. Uh, how, uh, how, much she might, uh, how might she make of it as essential to uh, a democracy? In, in Athens. She, she brings it up rather late, I think, in the work, is my recollection. She's talked about Femi much more, um, looking Assertion. carefully. But, but she does look, link those two she things. Definitely Assertiveness links them. is a phenomenon right. of, of Thumos. Right. Um, but I, it, whether she somehow was bringing that to the work, the ordering of discovery, at least in the book, is looking at words like fation, it must be asserted that, and thinking about those. Um, yeah, we probably should assume she knew about Thumas before, uh, from Plato. Um, but, but Aristotle does have a couple of other passages about Thumos. He, he at one point, links Thumos to, the, uh, the, uh, to, to, to loving, right? And, and, and the defending. I think that's referring mm -hmm. yeah. to the politics. The, the rhetoric is another good place to think about Thumos. Uh, anger is the paradigm passion. Um, all other passions do things very similar to anger and look, look like it. Um, it seems he wanted to give prominence to speech and not to animal Thumos. And then, which, um, um, in the politics, in in other parts of in other uh, works of Aristotle, there are parts of animals and so on. Um, Thumos is uh, is discussed as um, thematically and 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 um, as as a bodily passion. But uh, in Aristotle's politics is not so much about the passions. That's a modern topic. He's concerned with the objects of the passions. Thanks very much. Well, before we begin the second panel, I do just want to say uh, that this event is co-hosted and co-sponsored by the Foundation for Constitutional Government. They do so much great work with their Great Thinkers website, their Contemporary Thinkers website, uh, the Program on Constitutional Government at Harvard, and then, of course, the Conversations with Bill Crystal. We're very, very lucky to have our own conversation with Bill Crystal today. So, Bill, please. Thank you, Adam. Um, well, that first panel was a tough act to follow. Uh, everyone says that in Washington, you know, whenever they're the second panel. Well, that was really a tough act to follow. It's usually not true, actually. And most Washington panels are rather easy acts to follow. Uh, but that was not, not true of the first panel, which was really an uh, exemplary, I would say, instance of serious but also mostly accessible and uh, conversation about very important and interesting topics. It really is something that Hoover honestly should be, is proud, I'm sure, and, and certainly the Foundation for Constitutional Government is proud to have hosted and, and uh, proud to have uh, put on something that you probably won't find in most universities. So another case of some of the best education happening outside of the university uh, 
uh, context, though with professors, so I suppose we have to give them some credit. Anyway, we now decline from to, uh, no offense to my fellow panelists, to, to America, uh, and to a real country, on the other hand, for better or worse. Uh, and um, it's actually, I'm very much looking forward to this panel with uh, David Epstein and Peter Berkowitz on uh, America's democracy. Uh, each will speak, uh, both have studied with Harvey Mansfield, uh, knew Double Winthrop, are familiar with Aristotle, uh, and, uh, but we'll, we will now try to do justice to America in its own terms, or perhaps also in a little bit in Aristotle's terms. Uh, so this will proceed slightly differently on this panel. David and Peter will speak for 15 minutes each. Maybe I'll make a comment or two and ask a question or two, and then we'll have some time for Q&A, all of this in anticipation of the much, always the much heralded and much awaited Hoover refreshments, which show up at 5.15, in which we will certainly end on time for, so don't worry about that. Um, so, uh, I think you have their introduction. David Epstein uh, and I were in graduate school together and wrote a terrific dissertation on the Federalist uh, Papers, which he did publish as a book, uh, shortly after, and has since worked uh, in the government which is not responsible for anything he's saying here today. I always have to say that with people who work in the U.S. government. And Peter Berkowitz, uh, a senior fellow, whatever the right title is, at Hoover and taught at Harvard and has written on many topics from Nietzsche to uh, liberal democracy to uh, American politics today. So two terrific uh, panelists to continue, I hope, the uh, appropriately the high tone of the first panel. Um, so you can see I'm a little bit intimidated and daunted by that, but we'll all try to overcome it up here. So. Uh, David, do you want to begin? Uh, my employer is actually the Defense Department. They want me to be very clear that I do not speak for them today. So <laughs> all previous Defense Department doctrine on Aristotle remains in effect. <laughs> my th thesis is that Aristotle helps us understand the Federalist Papers. I will just assume for today that the Federalist Papers help us understand America. The Federalist does not actually mention Aristotle, but his, its authors were familiar with him. The two books share the subject of forms of government or regimes. What are the different types of regime? What are their parts? What preserves or destroys them? Which kind is best? The Federalist has a much more singular focus, the proposed Constitution of 1787. As Hamilton says in Federalist I, he's already made up his mind on what to support. He says, so I will not amuse you with an appearance of deliberation when I have decided. Aristotle, on the other hand, has a lot of amusing deliberations for us, including in book four where he says the political scientist should think of all different possible kinds of regimes, just like the student of animals should think of all different kinds of animals by thinking of all the necessary parts of animals, mouths, legs, stomachs, and then think of all the different animals that have all those different parts and then recombine them to get all possibilities. It seemed amusing to me. <laughs> Uh, but the idea is variety and thinking outside the box at what would be possible combinations, not just the actual combinations that have been seen. But the Federalist also has a comparative focus because it's not just arguing that the Constitution proposed in 1787 was the best possible. In fact, it admits that it's not and expresses quietly some reservations where it might have been made better. All they can say is it. All they have to say is it's much better than the status quo. We're we're in a crisis. We need to do something, and this is the best option. This is actually kind of Aristotelian because Aristotle also thinks you can't just simply think about what's best. The two main alternative kinds of regime that the Federalist takes a special interest in are the so-called pure democracy of ancient Greece and the English monarchy, a mixed government, which. Uh, I think was thought to practice what Aristotle recommended, which is a mixture of rule by the one, the few, and the many. The clearest contrast between the two books, I think, has to do with the ends of government. Aristotle states the end of government as human excellence, otherwise known as virtue. The Federalist states the end of government as justice, otherwise known as private rights. Aristotle is very aware that the end of human virtue is a high standard not likely to be met, and so he discusses much more other possible ends. The Federalist is not so flexible. It might even be considered doctrinaire by comparison. 
justice understood as private rights is not only the end of government, it is the end of civil society. An expression which reminds us of the social contract doctrine in which man in the state of nature ends the state of nature and creates civil society to protect his rights that were insecure in the state of nature. So that's the end of government in, this, in the sense that it's what the contracting parties intended and agreed to. This is an entirely modern doctrine, nothing like that in Aristotle, although the Federalist does not identify it as a modern doctrine. In fact, in Federalist 38, uh, Madison says there were ancient examples of government established by consent. Presumably, if you're arguing that something is a natural right, it is helpful to say that it has been understood uh, forever, not just uh, recently. Aristotle's closest equivalent, I think, to private rights is what he describes as the democratic principle in book six of living as one likes. So I think he recognizes the appeal of this end. He just doesn't describe it as a natural right. And the Federalist speaks about virtue, Aristotle's topic, but the Federalist speaks of it really only as a means, not as an end. Both of them also know that politics is not just a matter of serving the proper end. In any case, there are mundane necessities like preserving the regime against its foreign and domestic enemies. So there's a lot that could be compared in the two books, and I am going to confine myself to three papers in particular. Number nine, in which Hamilton is very critical of ancient republics. Number 63, in which Madison invokes ancient examples. And the mysterious number 37. Federalist 9, like Federalist 10, is about faction and insurrection. Number 9 begins with a lurid description of ancient political practice. And I quote, it is impossible to read the history of the petty republics of Greece and Italy without feeling sensations of horror and disgust at the distractions with which they were continually agitated and at the rapid succession of revolutions by which they were kept perpetually vibrating between the extremes of tyranny and anarchy. Now I think this is, the subject is faction. I think people familiar with the Federalists think of Federalist 10, which is about faction. But this brings out what Federalist 10 calls the violence of faction. That's Madison's phrase. Compared to political scientists have been more charmed by Madison's phrase, the mischiefs of faction, as if they were kind of pranks by teenagers. The violence is what it is brought out in Federalist 9. Madison in 10 calls this violence masked under the forms of the Constitution. In other words, the government is is guilty of majority tyranny and the, the, the violence is not obvious. In Federalist 51, he discusses how the masked violence can be countered by the real violence of a revolution against the regime committing it. But it's the violent conflict that appears in Federalist 9. Now, Aristotle is not the type to, discuss, to, to express a lot of horror and disgust, but I think he confirms Hamilton's description. Throughout the politics, we learn of various features of regimes that bring about factional conflict. And in book five, we get a systematic description with a lot of examples. Now, it might just be selection bias. Aristotle is only telling us about the dramatic outcomes. But it's somewhat striking that he doesn't actually describe a lot of policy disputes in the politics. He says man's political nature is to dispute about the just and the advantageous. But the disputes we see here are not about what should be done. They usually seem to mean one party ha is aggrieved at what the regime is trying to do and decides it should be ruling instead. So it's the justice and advantage of my part of the city ruling is the typical political question that comes up in Aristotle's book five. If you look at Aristotle's book, The Constitution of the Athenians, you really get chapter and verse to support Hamilton's description in number nine. There are 11 changes of regime in Athens, and many of them uh, quite violent. Federalist 9 says there is hope. Great improvements in the science of politics have been made since Aristotle. 
As Hamilton says, the efficacy of various principles is now well understood, which were either not known at all or imperfectly known to the ancients. Now, there are four of those principles. The Federalist will add one more. The one I'll mention is the representation of the people in the legislature by deputies of their own election. The famous transition from so-called pure democracy to representative democracy. The modern improvements Hamilton describes are actually all practiced already by England in a limited monarchy, also known as a mixed government, meaning, or what Hamilton calls a free government, meaning a government where the people have one part of the government, even if they don't have the whole thing. Hamilton says these improvements can be applied to a republic in order to remedy what he calls its imperfections and retain what he calls its excellencies. But he doesn't tell us what the excellencies are. And he doesn't say why we shouldn't just imitate England's mixed government. So Federalist 9 leaves that question open. Why do we want a republic? Federalist 39 addresses the question. It offers three quick arguments, the most important of which I think sounds like Aristotle, or at least it sounds like an argument offered by Aristotle. Uh, quoting Madison, no other form than a purely Republican form, or I'm sorry, strictly Republican, he says, no other form would be reconcilable with that honorable determination which animates every votary of freedom to rest all our political experiments on the capacity of mankind for self-government. He doesn't say no other form of government can protect our rights. He doesn't even say no other form can protect our rights as well. And he doesn't say no any other he doesn't say no other form can serve our other ends like security and prosperity. He also doesn't say we have the capacity for self-government. He says we are honorably determined to assume we have the capacity and to, as he says, build all of our political experiments on that assumption. That seems to mean not only all of our constitutions in the states and in the federal government, but all the parts of all of our constitutions. Now remember Aristotle in book three. He explains one of the problems of a ruling democracy is that it might well plunder the few, or a ruling oligarchy might plunder the many. And quoting Delba's translation, but must the reasonable rule and be sovereign over all? They, they wouldn't do these things. Is it then not necessity, if you have the reasonable rule, that all others be dishonored by not being honored in political rules? For we say that the rules are honors, and these ruling always, the others are necessarily dishonored. But is the, one, is the rule of the one most serious best, not, not the best uh, group, but the one best? Uh, but this is still more, more oligarchic, for there will be more dishonored. It is this consideration that leads up to Aristotle's most emphatic endorsement of democracy. Not all that emphatic, but he says that the multitude, rather than the best, but few ought to be sovereign, seems to have been said and to have some difficulty, but probably also truth. Again, that's Delba's rendition. Not exactly a full endorsement, but I think it makes clear the basic objection to rule by the reasonable. It dishonors everybody else. And that objection applies at least as strongly against rule by some few or one that are not the best, are not the reasonable. Federalist 63. I've already mentioned this emphasis on representation as an improvement on pure democracy, where the people are assembled in person. In Federalist 63, Madison makes a correction to this distinction. The Federalist 63 is recommending a Senate for the US, and one of the arguments is all of the long-lived ancient republics had Senates. Therefore, it seems, why don't we have a Senate? But he seems to sense an objection. Doesn't the modern improvement made by representation fix things so that we don't really need a Senate? I cannot now resist reading to you the judgment of Thomas Jefferson, who thought the innovation of representation made Aristotle's work entirely obsolete. 
Someone wrote to Jefferson asking, which translation of Aristotle's politics is the best? Jefferson wrote back, he wasn't really sure about that, but he did say this. So different was the state of society then and with those people from what it is now and with us that I think little edification can be obtained from their writings on the subject of government. The introduction of this new principle of representative democracy has rendered useless almost everything written before on the structure of government and in a great measure relieves our regret if the political writings of Aristotle or of any other ancient have been lost or are unfaithfully rendered or explained to us. So despite all of Delba's efforts to re faithfully render and explain Aristotle, the University of Chicago Press can forget about getting a blurb from Thomas Jefferson to put on the back of the book. <laughs> now Madison's answer is that representation is actually not a modern invention. He says, the principle of representation was neither unknown to the ancients nor wholly overlooked in their political constitutions. And then he recounts some examples, some of which were found in Aristotle, of offices in Sparta and Crete. Here he says the ancients were practicing representation. Quoting, he says, the true distinction between these and the American governments lies in the total exclusion of the people in their collective capacity from any share in the latter and not in the total exclusion of the representatives of the people from the administration of the former. He says, this is a most advantageous superiority in favor of the United States. So we learn in Federalist 63, the ancient republics, even the democratic ancient republics, were not pure democracies. They were mixtures of democracy and representation. Schematically, there seem to be three options. Ancient democracies, partly assembled, partly elected. English monarchy, partly elected, partly self-appointed. America, entirely elected. Madison says being an unmixed republic, purely elective, is better than either of the other things. I think one reason for that is that he thinks the mixtures tend to become unmixed, despite the, the uh, fame of mixed government. In England, he says, by 1787, the House of Commons has entirely cowed the English king. This shows what he calls the irresistible force possessed by that branch of a free government that has the people on its side. But the same thing happened in, even in these long-lived ancient republics with their senates. The assemblies ultimately prevailed over the senates. Aristotle also observes that the dominant part of the regime tends to become more dominant, contrary to Aristotle's advice, which is that they should moderate themselves so as to preserve themselves for longer. In Madison's view, a wholly elective government like ours is more likely to last because it has no less popular branch than the representative branch that will undermine it, and there's no more popular branch than the representative branch that, uh, I'm sorry, I put it the, the wrong way. There's, there's no less popular branch to be undermined by the popular branch, and there's no more popular branch that would otherwise undermine our popular branch of representative government. Aristotle distinguished the unlimited office of the assemblyman from the limited office held by particular officials. America turns the unlimited office of the citizen in the assembly into a limited office. We only get to exert our power every couple of years. And the Federalist thinks this is good for us. An unassembled people cannot be moved, he says, by the spirit of cabal that you find in, a, in an assembly. And in Federalist 40, 55, he says, an assembly of Socrateses would not be, I'm sorry, would be carried away by passion. But in 49, he says, a nation of philosophers, meaning not assembled, would be reasonable. So reasonable it would not need any laws. The people's limited office resembles the office Aristotle called auditor, which means you review what has been done rather than deciding what to do yourself. And he praised Solon in Athens for assigning that to the people. 
the customer is capable of judging a good shoe or a good meal, even if not capable of being a shoemaker or a chef. But I think that understates the role of the people in our government. The idea that the people are the sole source of authority makes us more opinionated, partisan, and vigilant than the term auditor suggests. We're passionately attached to our own opinions, as Federalist 10 tells us, eager to vex and oppress our opponents, frustrated that we can only do this every couple of years, nurturing our pride and our discontent, but somehow avoiding the vibration of the regime between tyranny and anarchy. Finally, let me take a quick dip in the deep philosophical waters of the first panel, only long enough to remark that Federalist 37 was swimming there too. Delba tells us of the political importance of the question of man's place in nature. Is a human being part of bodily being in general, or are we some kind of exception? Or are we the rule so that bodily being should be understood in light of how we understand ourselves instead of vice versa? Delba does not refer to either evolution or artificial intelligence, but I think those are the topics under which her questions arise today. Federalist 37 has a very surprising digression on the difficulty of distinguishing the parts of nature. And I quote, the most sagacious and laborious naturalists have never yet succeeded in tracing with certainty the line which separates the district of vegetable life from the neighbor, neighboring region of unorganized matter, or which marks the termination of the former and the commencement of the animal empire. A still greater obscurity lies in the distinctive characters by which the objects in each of these great departments of nature have been arranged and assorted. He says not just the great kingdoms, animal, vegetable, and mineral, but the the, these have unclear boundaries and they have unclear characteristics. He says this is still more so, meaning still less clear, about the various provinces and lesser portions into which they are subdivided. I think it's clear that human beings are one of those provinces. I think Federalist 39's remark about honorable determination should be considered in the light of Federalist 37. Our uncertainty about human beings requires or maybe allows us to make honorable determinations rather than scientific observations about the capacities of mankind. The Federalist calls this an experiment as if our example <coughs> of what we do in America might prove something about human capacity. Well, maybe it proves something enough roughly to influence future human beings facing the same choice. But it, I doubt that it's proven against the most exacting skepticism, which could attribute our success either to luck, or it could point out that we're not really sure what success is, or maybe there's some unseen bodily natural processes at work. So it's hard to see that we can really prove human capacity but it's also hard to see how we could disprove human capacity. After all, none of the past failures before the Federalist discouraged them. Honorable determination may be able to and may have to stand on its own. Quoting Delba, page 30, perhaps one must assert more than one could reasonably say with confidence about the kinds of being and their unity. I thought that, um to try and say a few useful things about Aristotle today, I would mention uh, some lessons I learned from Harvey about Aristotle. Um, I hope you won't, I hope he won't think that inappropriate on a day honoring Delba. Uh, I know Harvey learned a lot from uh, Delba's work on Aristotle, but I suspect Delba learned a thing or two from Harvey as well about Aristotle. So uh, I begin with uh, a recollection. Way back when I was in college, at Swarthmore College, I had some outstanding teachers, and they had uh, an apocalyptic bent. Uh, 
my teachers taught me that liberal modernity, this is what was crystallized in the writings of Hobbes and Locke. Some people say it was launched by Machiavelli. I learned from my teachers that this liberal modernity was corrupt and incoherent, that it was decadent beyond, beyond redemption or repair. And around this time, in the 1980s, I read a book, uh, encouraged to do so by my teachers, called After Virtue. After Virtue extended the argument. After Virtue argued by Alistair McIntyre, argued that the truth of liberal modernity was seen by, was expressed in the writings of Nietzsche. Nietzsche argued that God was dead, truth was a fiction, and therefore everything was permitted. Nietzsche saw, saw through the sham and the glamour and the arrogance of liberal modernity. Nietzsche was the teacher of nihilism. And therefore, McIntyre argued, we were confronted with a choice. The truth of liberal modernity was Nietzsche nihilism, so it was either nihilism or to return before Nietzsche, before liberal modernity, to what defined morality uh, in the pre-modern era. This was, McIntyre argued decisively, the Aristotelian tradition. The choice was Nietzsche or Aristotle. I found this claim intriguing, uh, and if true, highly consequential, and I set out to investigate it. The investigation continues, uh, but I have made some progress, uh, and I owe uh, some of that progress to, uh, to what I learned from Harvey. What I learned from Harvey was, when I was a young assistant professor, that the choice was not Aristotle or Nietzsche, but rather Locke because Aristotle. What do I mean? Well, um, let me try to sum this up in uh, three, three wonderful uh, utterances uh, of Harvey's from different places. One, strangely enough, comes from uh, the bio that I read uh, when I was arriving to Harvard long ago. And so you can still find it on his uh, Harvard homepage. Among, uh, under the bio, among the other, uh, other topics that he writes about, Harvey's bio says, he is written in defense of a defensible liberalism. In defense of a defensible liberalism. Way back I wondered, wh what was that? It must mean that it was a liberalism different from, say, the one that John Rawls expounded and different from the one that Alistair McIntyre criticized. Around this time, I also encountered a book by uh, Harvey, early 90s, I guess, a collection of essays called uh, America's Constitutional Soul. Well, that's a provocative title. Why? Because soul, uh, as we students of political philosophy know, denotes something pre-modern. But what could be more modern than the American Constitution? The title, as if to suggest that the modern liberal tradition, the Constitution, had to be understood not only on its own terms, but from a wider perspective. The third utterance. I heard this from a graduate student. Uh, so as many of you know, uh, Harvey has been in the practice for many years now of teaching an upper level introduction to the history of political philosophy, ancient and medieval in the fall, moderns in the spring. At the end of one of these year-long sequ sequences, a precocious student raised his hand, according to the story, and asked his teacher, uh, so Mr. Mansfield, all year you've expounded to us one great political philosopher after another. Can you tell us who's your favorite? Where do you stand? And according to legend, Harvey replied, 
Locke in the short run, Aristotle in the long run. What to make of this Delphic utterance? What would it look like to defend America's constitutional manner, America's constitutional soul, in a manner uh, informed by Aristotle's political science? What would it look like to defend America's constitutional soul in a manner informed by Aristotle's political science? Well, uh, at the risk of being presumptuous, maybe something like this. You might begin with where we are, what the situation is. The situation is, it seems to me, as the 116th Congress uh, will be sworn in in January, uh, that both sides take delight in denouncing the other side and attributing to the other side the most extreme uh, and inadequate views. You would consider opinions expressed by leading figures. On the left, people accuse uh, the President and the Republicans in Congress of bringing about, of us, placing us on the edge of fascism. This even though uh, the President's main achievements consist in cutting taxes, deregulating the economy, and that unlike fascists on the question of immigration, this idea is not to conquer other lands, but to bring immigration under, under law. On the right, meanwhile, the right adopts a kind of siege mentality, proclaims, or at least mutters, it's dedicated, it should be dedicated to, uh, to total war, even though, come January 1919, even though we'll have divided government, uh, because the Democrats will control the House, still, Republicans will control the White House, have a stronger majority in the Senate, have a majority on the uh, Supreme Court that believes that the job of judges is to uh, interpret the Constitution, is to interpret what the Constitution says and not impute to it what they believe it ought to mean. And that um, tumult in media notwithstanding, conservative media has never been more lively or more prolific. You notice the problem. Extreme opinions on either side, much invective, much sloganeering. You can see that what's necessary is a wider perspective, a more capacious sensibility, more flexible orientation. And this, I think, is what Aristotelian political science provides, matters we've only touched on. But isn't it really impossible for all the wise and incisive observations that have made today to return to Arist Aristotelian political science? Isn't it true that Aristotelian political science rests on a discredited view of nature and human nature? Isn't it true that, Ar Ar that Aristotle's political science is devoted to the cultivation of virtue? And isn't it true that the cultivation of virtue is only possible in the best regime? And what about, uh, this has been mentioned, Aristotle's views about, um, about natural slaves? And even with uh, Delba's uh, heroic efforts to claim his, reclaim his opinions about women, but at least on the surface, his exclusion of women from politics. Well, there are a couple of remarks to be made here. First, it seems to me that such questions provide an excellent introduction to Aristotle. After all, as others have noted, Aristotle begins his ethical and political inquiries with the questions that people ask with disputed matters, that it, opinions that are in currency. So what about these questions? Well, on the question of metaphysics, theoretical propositions about nature and human nature, as others have pointed out, actually Aristotle's reflections generally have as their point of departure the opinions that are in, cur are, that are uh, in currency, that are floating about, that are put forward, that are disputed. This is not to say that there is not a theoretical dimension to Aristotle's politics and his ethics. Uh, we've seen that today. It is to say 
that they are not at the center of his discourses, and one arrives at them by working through the political opinions of the day. What about Aristotle on the question of the best regime? Well, there's no doubt that Aristotle does argue that in the best case, political regime is devoted to the cultivation of virtue. But it's also clear that Aristotle argues that the best case is, in the best case, extremely rare. As a practical matter, we have to organize our political lives around what's practically attainable, what's the most likely case. And it turns out Aristotle is a defender, in fact, probably the originator of the idea of the mixed regime. And what's the most practically attainable and best form of the mixed regime that Aristotle discusses? Well, it's a mix, it turns out, of democracy and oligarchy. You could say, without uh, t being too misleading, of democracy and the elites, of the people and the elites. This is a regime that's characterized by freedom and equality of citizens. It's characterized by a division of labor, recognizes difference in abilities and talents uh, and attainments. You might say, notwithstanding uh, Thomas Jefferson's reservations, you might say that the regime closest to it in the modern world is liberal democracy of the sort that we practice here in the United States. As for natural slavery, I'll just mention very quickly that, uh, that Aristotle's uh, definition of the natural slave, one who can receive but cannot exercise reason, actually serves as a reproach to the conventional practice of slavery uh, in Athens. Uh, and as for his opinions about uh, women, I, I certainly can't go beyond the uh, uh, subtle observations already made, but I will say this, that Aristotle's political science directs our attention to the opinions that people actually hold. And as opinions change, so should our understanding of the regime. And Aristotelian political science asks us to would ask us to direct the same question toward liberal democracy that he directed toward the regimes that he was familiar with. And that is, what are the causes that preserve and destroy liberal democracy? To answer that question, Aristotle reminds again and again that it's particularly important to bear in mind the tendency of regimes and the partisans within the regimes, as David mentioned, to take their principles to an extreme. Therefore, Aristotle finds himself time and again making practical suggestions as to how regimes can moderate this tendency. Very briefly, some suggestions in our context. Let's start with um, the vexed debate. Should we be populists or elitists? Of course, Aristotle's answer already prefigured in his account of the mixed regime is that our real aim in our politics is to understand as carefully as we can the legitimate claims of the people, in our case, to have their concerns about their jobs, about their communities, about their futures represented, along with the legitimate claims of the experts, of the professionals, of the men and women of outstanding experience and character to exercise political power. What about the debate about, uh, the current debate about nationalism or liberal democracy? False distinction, as it's sometimes uh, argued. It seems to me from the point of view of Arist Aristotelian political science, we would recognize that it all depends on the question of nationalism, what it is to which the nation is devoted. Certainly, sometimes, national spirit can lead in the direction of authoritarianism and conquest. But if the national spirit happens to be one in which at the center is a dedication to liberty, toleration, pluralism, a diversity of communities, that national spirit might inform a liberal democracy that is the best bet for preserving freedom. Today, we encounter also a kind of uh, utopianism. Harkens back to uh, the work of Alistair McIntyre. Sometimes goes under the title the Benedict Option. This concludes that liberal democracy today 
is so degraded, so unredeemable, that what we must do is, uh, is turn our backs on it, create isolated communities, and wait to develop theories that would be appropriate for new, new forms of uh, practice, new forms of community. From the Aristotelian point of view, it seems to me we should be more cautious. We would appreciate, we would uh, appreciate that the best re best regime is not something we can expect to be realized. While it provides a kind of model for reform, we are not to invoke it, the distance between us and it, as an excuse for repudiating the actual achievements of the regime under under which we live. Yes, with the help of Aristotle, we can recognize the grandeur of the true statesman. And yes, with the help of Aristotle, we can recognize just how scarce such, such statesmen are. Education. According to Aristotle, comment he repeats a couple of times, nothing co contributes more to the preservation of the regime than an education. Education in what? An education in the mores in the laws, in the principles of the regime. For us, that means liberal education. Liberal education especially built around the tradition of freedom. But an education built around the tradition of freedom would be an education that includes not only the critics of Aristotelian political science, but Aristotle and Aristotelian political science itself. Aristotelian political science also recognizes that without concord, that pre-political understanding that you're involved in a common undertaking, liberal democracy can't survive because it can't survive without winners in the election who are magnanimous in their victory and losers in elections who are gracious in defeat. Now, you could say that these admonitions that these, that these rules of thumb, that these, this advice of prudence is nothing very fancy. You could say that it's not particularly scientific. You could say that it's refined common sense, subtle judgment, supple practical accommodation. You could say that, and you would be largely right. But it's also worth remembering that such things are an extremely short supply today, and they really ought to, we ought to rec there ought to be a high demand for them. Thank you. Well, thank you, Peter. Maybe I'll ask a question, David, first, if that's okay, and then Peter can comment on that and talk a little bit more, if not, we're not, and go, go to you all. I guess, I mean, obviously, David didn't claim to give a complete exposition of the Federalist, but I would say your account of the Federalist, of those three pa based on those three papers, uh, lean more towards the if I can put it in shorthand, the honorable determination uh, to vindicate whatever the capacity of mankind for self-government side of the Federalist, as opposed to the new science of politics side of the Federalist. That is, the Federalist, I would say, is conventionally taught in political science departments, is very much checks and balances, new science of politics. No one needs to particularly assert himself or herself or, uh, you know, have much prudence or judgment, to use Peter's recent term, because it's a machine that will run of itself. That's always been a slightly cartoonish political science -y version, perhaps, of the Federalist, but there's certainly elements of that that are in there, and you could almost say that at times it seems that Madison doesn't mind, wouldn't mind if people sort of took that point of view, almost, that it, that it, it sort of is going to work by itself. You don't, have to rec you don't have to be a founder yourself to make the system, later generations don't have to be founders to make the system work. The other side of it, which you emphasize perhaps is more that the Federalist teaches us to think like the people who wrote the Federalist and that that somehow is always necessary. And I'm just curious how you think those go together. And I'll just add a Jefferson point because you cited that wonderful, in its own way wonderful, I've got to say, even though we're all supposed to dislike it, I suppose, letter of Jefferson where he dismisses Aristotle out of hand, has a certain, of course, common sense to it that why are we reading this 2,000-year-old book before all these modern inventions? Um, uh, Jefferson also, but he also at the same time does recommend, I think, Aristotle elsewhere, so maybe that was just that he had a particular, you know, letter writer that in, in mind who was, shouldn't read Aristotle or something. Um, I mean, I'm thinking the famous letter, which uh, I very much like Jefferson's last letter, which is a public letter to Roger Waitman, I believe his name was, the mayor of Washington. This is right before he dies in 1826. Jefferson writes this famous open letter explaining that he can't come to the, uh, 
his 50th uh, anniversary celebration of the Declaration in Washington, and he regrets that he can't come. And in it, he says, on the one hand, it's one of his most famous statements of, a, of let's call it the progressive scientific view, sciences. Uh, he delights that science is increasingly what uh, science is opening, uh, has opened all uh, has opened and is opening or is opening all eyes. Uh, the progress of science has opened or is opening all eyes to the rights of man, uh, that it's increasingly uh, the, the palpable truth that no man is entitled to govern another uh, by the grace of God or presumably by any other uh, claim. Um, that was the one that was foremost in Jefferson's mind. Um, so that sort of scientific progress is going to take care of this problem of of almost of tyranny, it seems like, uh, and we just need to hang on until science keeps opening people's eyes with this, to this palpable truth. In the very same letter, on the other hand, Jefferson uh, says something about how he wishes he could be in Washington. I wish I'd, I'd reproduced this, but wishes he could be in Washington to, uh, because it's wonderful that, uh, um, how does he put it, that our fellow citizens uh, celebrate the, uh, the election we made uh, 50 years ago. We, meaning the representatives, clearly in this. He said, well, there are only three of us still alive, I think he said something like that. And I, he would love on their behalf, on behalf of those still living, to be there to uh, sort of acknowledge that the, the, uh, that the, uh, they've been vindicated. This, the election they made, the choice they made, has been vindicated by their fellow citizens. Something that makes very clear, and the Declaration, of course, does this itself at its conclusion when it, the representatives step forth and pledge to each other their lives, fortunes, and sacred honor, not to the citizens. It makes very clear the sort of, let's call it the aristocratic or the element of the Declaration and of Jefferson's own thought, just as in the Federalists, there are those two strains of, hey, we're just, you know, representatives of the people here. Uh, and then we actually are stepping forward to assert something and do something that the people might not fully appreciate right now, but hopefully they will later on approve of. Um, anyway, just so these two strains, I mean, how do they go together, and can they be sort of kept together, I guess, the obvious question, or does one start to, does one increasingly, oh, does the science of politics or the prog progress, the, the faith in progress increasingly overwhelm the uh, sense of the necessity of statesmanship and of those who really understand how to uh, uh, understand the, com the complexities of politics in a more Aristotelian way? I think that um, you know the side that says it's a machine that goes of itself is related to the emphasis on private rights as the end. I mean, what you would really want is a system that will guarantee that without anyone having to do anything particular. Um, but in fact, the system does rely on human energies and activities. Um, so... There's, there's both kind of the role of the politicians uh, and of the sort of partisan voters. I, you know, if in Federalist One, Hamilton says, we're going to have a big partisan debate about the Constitution. And this happens every time he says there's a great national question, which seems to have included the American Revolution, at least initially, when there was this tremendous division. And I think the idea is... In the future, we don't want to have great national questions all the time. You would kind of like a certain number of things can kind of be settled within the legislature and the people will look and they'll say, okay, close enough, you know, and they vote in the people who did well. Uh, and you don't have a kind of agitated uh, population. But from time to time, you will have great national questions. Um, so I think the, the, the statesmanship... Uh, remains, um, but as I said, I think I think that's part of the machine. It, it's it's sort of not an alternative to the machine. And you don't think it's uh, made more difficult though by the increase by the faith in the machine, so to speak, or that people understand that the machine doesn't run of itself. In fact, that people somehow. I mean, what I worry more about is the uh, lack of faith in the machine. That, right, well. Um, Speaking of lack of faith in the machine. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, um, w we often hear it said, occasionally I say it myself, that um, the modern, modern political thought emphasizes 
institutions, the machine, uh, to direct us to uh, uh, socially useful behavior, or we could say advancing the public interest. And the classics teach us to uh, focus on virtue. But I suspect Madison would have been amazed by the question, is this new constitution one that's reliant on institutions, or is it one that's reliant upon virtue? After all, he does say, I think in Federalist 55, that this form of government, popular government, is more dependent upon virtue than any other form of government. Why is that? Because the people rule, the people decide. Uh, so we need a, a modicum of judgment and good character in everybody. And yet, who could deny uh, the complex institutional arrangements that uh, the American Constitution establishes? Indeed, Hamilton celebrates them in Federalist No. 9, the institutional innovations brought about. So uh, in a way to answer Bill's question, we have to ask ourselves, what has brought about a situation in which so many people think, especially, uh, sorry all you professors, the professors in our university, not, nobody in this room, but all the professors, not, many who are not in this room, why do, they th why do they think that a serious person must make a choice? Are you an institutionalist or are you a virtue person? Line up sign up, and that's your theory, and defend it to the hilt. Again, one of the values of uh, studying Aristotle, who focuses so much on the practical accommodations of uh, the partial but legitimate claims of contending parties in the policy, is to help us appreciate better our, our inheritance, which doesn't in the first place, got some tendencies, but doesn't in the first place uh, compel us to make such a stark choice. Yeah, thing, I mean, in, in 55, he, I think, uses the expression sufficient virtue. And I think there's a sense in which if you design the institutions well, you don't have to have quite as much virtue. Yes. So that all, all you need really is people who are elected who are willing to obey the law and not try to, say, violently overthrow the regime. I mean, they're, they're, they're kind of willing that, to accept the election, that, which is not that much virtue, but it's something. It, it's not, but keep in mind, Aristotle says something very similar about polity. This is not virtue in the fullest sense, right. but we can have, maybe we can bring about as much as we need to prevent the regime from deteriorating. I mean, Tocqueville, who will just stipulate as the modern Aristotle here, um, seems very worried that a Jeffersonian point of view, I mean, he doesn't mention or barely mentions the Declaration, doesn't seem to be a big fan of natural rights thinking as sort of becoming excessively dominant in this regime, even though it is the basis, obviously, of the regime in some sense. It seems to think that this kind of thinking by itself is going to make it harder for people to, to think intelligently about what's needed to maintain the political order or to improve the political order. And I guess that would be another way of putting the question. That don't you, in that, it maybe in that respect, I mean, Aristotle remains accessible to us, so that's a, itself a kind of uh, correction, perhaps, to, to a kind of uh, scientific progressivism or simple-minded natural rights legalism or all the obvious things that are sort of built in there. And I suppose, as I think David said, since regimes have a tendency to become more like themselves or to exaggerate their own impulses, surely are, we're going to get stronger as things went on and probably did in some ways. So, I mean, is there, is, what is the, to get back to Aristotle, there is, I guess I would say that one does have to, doesn't one have to go back to, isn't there a utility in actually going back to Aristotle uh, as a student of politics, which then puts into question, though, the, the certainty of the political science on which our regime is founded, or is that fine if people aren't, aren't fervent believers in natural rights? This is a big Lincoln. I mean, Diana should discuss this at some point. I mean, I'm sure will. Maybe she will when I have a discussion with her, a filmed conversation with her in, two, in three or four weeks on Lincoln. I mean, all honor to Jefferson. But on the other hand, it's not good if people just have a simple-minded kind of, you know, faith in natural rights and progress as resolving everything. Uh, just a brief comment, uh, yes, but again, from the study of Aristotle, this is a familiar problem. Democracy, um, 
makes it more difficult for the Democrats to understand the full claims of virtue. Oligarchy, in practical terms, the rule of the wealthy, makes it harder, as it, as it spreads out its principle, to understand the full claims of virtue. This is, by the way, not to minimize the problem we face. It's just to say that this problem, that uh, the radicalization, absolutization of certain liberal and democratic principles in our regime doesn't make, doesn't distinguish modernity. Um, it rather s uh, shows modernity, liberal modernity behaving more or less as Aristotle would have helps us understand it, it tends to behave. Just on Tocqueville, I mean, it does seem to me that Tocqueville's attempt to show that democracy is the inevitable wave of the future kind of corresponds to what I've described in The Federalist of making this choice for wholly popular government and trying to figure out how to mix the proper ingredients of government within that rather than trying to mix these alternative claims and keep them alive. Yeah, that's, I think that's good. And I mean, and obviously Tocqueville re-understands everything from individual rights to self-interest to religion, arguably, in a new way, in a, I don't know, not quite in the way perhaps that Descartes, as he puts it, or Locke might have understood them or explained them, but more in, in a more Aristotelian way. So I suppose that's the way he mixes. He accepts the terms or the... Uh, ideas, and I think as Marx sort of suggested in the first panel, accepts that they have actually done, there's a lot they actually have to contribute uh, to human well-being and to the s stability and flourishing of a democratic regime, but uh, that but they do need to be re-understood, it does seem, by Tocqueville seems to think. He doesn't deduce natural rights from the state of nature or anything like that. Just the question I was prevented from asking on the last panel. <laughs> well, in that case, forget it, you know, right? <laughs> One or two each of you, please. Uh, it doesn't have to be specific policies, but at least concrete policy goals in the modern American Democratic Republic that an Aristotelian would want to pursue for the sake of what an Aristotelian would see as reform of our type of democracy. Two words, liberal education. Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah, say the same thing. Right? More people reading and beginning to understand Aristotle would be a good start, right? don't you think? And I think generally, this is perfectly obvious, but you know, a more a respect for forms, well, that's easy to say, what does that mean? But I'd say it translates in the real world to a kind of respect for a style, for institutions, for, for uh, norms, for processes, a certain willingness to put off the desire to achieve short-term goals, Peter alluded to this earlier, in place of understanding this is how the system or the process works. That's something that's kind of boring, legalistic, uh, frustrating at times, but is actually pretty important, I think, to uh, compared to the alternative. I mean, I think maybe Peter already made this point, but I think moderation is the basic impulse. Don't push the principles as far as they could go, but look for the opposite principle and think what merit it might have. David, I think you put your finger on something very important when you quoted that passage from Madison on honorable determination, you know, as, you know, as a fundamental way of thinking about the justification of the commitment to self-rule or self-government. Uh, and it raises, it raises the question of what makes that commitment to self-government particularly honorable. Uh, and here's, here's a hunch which I think may connect, uh, you know, connect Madison with Delba's Aristotle. And that is that democracy is the form of government in which self-assertion is democratized, where everyone can stand up to some extent. Everyone can assert him or herself to some extent. Uh, and perhaps also, you know, it's, you know it, it suggests that, you know, there is something abrasive about being told what to do by someone else. You know, that goes against something very deep, even when it's necessary uh, for our own well-being. There's, you know, there's a t human tendency to sort of kick up your heels and say, you know, no, you know, I want to decide for myself. And so is, 
is what I've just said consistent with your understanding of Madison's understanding of what is honorable in this determination? Yes. <laughs> I mean, I, one other phrase I would quote is Madison at some point says, uh, government should be impartial to the rights and pretensions of all citizens. And it's the pretensions part that strikes me as an interesting word. That uh, it, it's sort of you assume everyone has certain pretensions to rule and you let them try. One part that I didn't really bring out in the talk is the role of seeking office in this. I mean, it's not simply you know, sort of the strictly Republican regime requires people to be elected, but it also means everybody is eligible. And uh, that, that's important. In a way, it, it seems like Aristotle makes more of a theme of that than the Federalist. And Aristotle is kind of interested in lot rather than vote. And when you make the whole people eligible by lot, you, you, res you respect their, uh, their pretensions, uh, you know, even if they're not voted for. Uh, so the, this kind of role of, of, of office seeking, not just electing, I think manifests the same spirit. And I suppose that the, I mean, what, the thing you're, the bills refer, kind of widespread democratic assertiveness, let's call it, is itself not fully democratic or egalitarian because people have, as Madison says, unequal abilities. And so they'll be at unequal uh, goals as well, perhaps, in the use of those abilities. And so the, it's not... This is Diana's point, I think, at the very beginning of the first panel. The all in the democracy it doesn't seem quite as homogeneous as one might at first think. What if it's allowed, if each part of it or each individual in it, I suppose, or some many individuals in it are allowed to assert themselves. So there's a way in which you get a push towards a kind of diversity, to, to use a fashionable term, uh, from a kind of equal democratic uh, determination to, to self-government. Um, and then various institutions can strengthen that and allow that to be uh, protected too, as, as Madison's very concerned to do. Can I just uh, amplify that? that what, what we see, it seems to me, building on what uh, David and Bill have just said, is balancing in the uh, Aristotelian spirit. Honorable self-assertion is actually, uh, it's actually not amplified by it, or democratic honorable self-assertion is not amplified by, but limited by, uh, office seeking in elections. From Aristotle's point of view, elections are actually an aristocratic element within democracy. It limits democracy because, um, no snickering here, the aim of elections is to find the people best suited for office. People who, with the passion, with the you energy... You can snicker the at this point uh, if you okay. want. Yeah. <laughs> I, I said, well, that's the aim. They don't, they don't always succeed. Now you can snicker. Okay. So, it, so it seems to me what we see at work um, in, the, in Madison's understanding of the Constitution is a balance of the competing claims of um, democratic self-assertion and the need for, let's say, a modicum of uh, excellence in governing. I wanted to ask uh, all of you what you thought Aristotle might make of our modern theory of uh, the separation of powers. Um, obviously, for Aristotle, the uh, sort of tendencies or the powers that we can identify in different aspects of the structure of government are social ones, democratic, oligarchic, tyrannical. Um, uh, we moderns have other terms. Um, we have found perhaps that the social world is uh, one that's prone to shift and that it's uh, a good idea to identify uh, different st structures of government in other terms. Um, of course, this tendency to identify structures of government in social terms has come back in a vulgar way, Marxism or sans Um But uh, I guess to me it remains unclear what, what Aristotle would make of these terms. I uh, certainly agree that you'd respect institutions and these ideas have institutions built on top of them which seem to work rather well, but I don't know if his Greekness um, <laughs> would you know, cause him to have some sort of problem with that. So. I mean, I think of the social balancing not really as the ancient counterpart to the separation of powers, but the ancient counterpart to the extended sphere argument, which looks at how you deal with the, the balancing of the rich and the poor. The separation of powers, you know, Aristotle has something that seems kind of 
in the same general ballpark when he describes the assembly and the offices, uh, including the judges. And these are different functions that you use to create different varieties of regime by designing them in different ways. Um, he doesn't put the emphasis on their checking each other in the way that you see in the modern separation of powers. I mean, particularly Madison says, I mean, Madison's big point in 48 or so is you have to mix the powers enough so that they're sharing powers so that they can check each other. In Aristotle, it seems like it's not so much a checking as everybody gets some share in the government. And even if they're not really stopping the other guy, they are just kind of included. And that's somehow satisfying. Um, whereas I think in, in Madison, it's much more they, they resist each other. Toward the end of the politics, Aristotle asks, which is better, to be ruled by the best man or the best laws? His answer, the best laws, because even the best man is subject uh, to the distortions of, of thumos, the spirited part of the soul. Um, it seems to me that we can regard separation of powers as uh, one of those innovations that if not invented by uh, the Americans or in the modern era, was brought to a, uh, an unprecedented level of perfection. And it seems to me we can understand the separation of powers as uh, advancing an Aristotelian interest of um, preserving the rule of law for an extended republic. I guess I would just add, I once knew more about this than I do now when I wrote my dissertation on some of this, but <laughs> I mean, if it sounds very Hobbesian or modern, the separation of powers, though I suppose strictly it should be the separation of power if it were a more Hobbesian understanding. And one of the strangest things about the separation of powers is the Federalist Papers go out of their way, the Federalist goes out of its way to present it in this slightly mechanistic way. But these powers do seem to have a nature as of each of them. It's never really explained, and you don't get a kind of Aristotelian, I'm not sure this would be Aristotle, but let's say, or classical deduction of, well, this is the nature of the power, and therefore it should have these qualities. It's sort of backwards, almost deductive. Well, this one has these qualities. The judges have to have life tenure, and that's because when you think a little bit about the judicial power in its relation to the others, and then you think about Federalist 49 and the need for reverence, and it turns out you're thinking about an awful lot of things, you have to understand that this is the right feature for this power to have. But it is, I'd say, there's a kind of hidden Aristotelianism in the Federalist and maybe in the American Constitution, which, for whatever, I think, for whatever reason, for maybe for obvious reasons, is kind of hidden. It's unclear at every moment how self-conscious it is even, perhaps, though I think it's pretty self-conscious for the founders and for thoughtful students of the Constitution. But it, it is not deduced from, you know, in some grand way, it's uh, almost built up. Well, think of the Constitution, and it's not like this is a very big mystery in the Constitution itself, right? The executive power shall be vested. The judicial power, where did they come from? They're not, like, deduced from anything, you know? They just seem to sort of exist, you know, out there as sort of the natural division somehow of government or of governing or of, I don't know, the human capacity for self-government or the ways in which humans would govern themselves or something or the tasks of a government and then, uh, you know, are then, as I say, so that's, you know, there's a kind of maybe hidden Aristotelianism, I've always thought, in the separation of powers, which on the surface is in a way the most modern, uh, the new science of politics part of the Constitution. One last, yeah, go ahead, please. Just because of our theme, I should note Federalist 37 in this discussion of the difficulty of making distinctions, this is the initial example. No, the, the greatest ad adepts in the science of politics have never yet succeeded in distinguishing these powers. Right, so to correct my excessively formalistic and high-toned discussion, there would have to be some assertiveness also as to the character of these. Yeah, these powers are not actually in nature, but they're sort of a combination of humans deciding that, well, that would be an interesting question, is how much they're asserted and how much they're discovered, which itself is sort of addressed in Federalist 37, right? Yeah, in a way, right? Thank you very much. Professor Winthrop argued that uh, in Tocqueville, uh, rights were a functional equivalent for aristocratic honor. Now, Tocqueville defines honor as a, a comparison based on class arrangements, and so it's an aristocratic hangover. Um, uh, now, Aristotle says that that the psychological motive for virtue and civic virtue is the beauty of the noble, the fair, and F-A-R-E, not F-A-I-R. Um, would there be anything 
uh, what one might uh, think equivalent, uh, an analogous to Winthrop's argument uh, for honor and rights in terms of uh, what is, attracts moral character. We've seen with the funerals of our recent warrior statesmen, uh, Senator McCain and President Bush, uh, people are starting to notice these guys had beauty to the kinds of persons they were. Um, do we see anything equivalent here? Uh, is my, uh, my question. Uh, yes, but I'd say the connection is, uh, is not quite so um, attenuated or in, uh, in need of as much uh, interpretation. Um, to see rights as a form of, uh, form of honor requires a fair amount of interpretation. To see, um, to look at how uh, elder statesmen are praised uh, when they pass away does not require you often to um, uh, translate from one vocabulary to another. The vocabulary that we have, as unpracticed as we may be in it, is the, pra is the, is the vocabulary of, of character. Uh, the Federalist calls fame the ruling passion of the noblest minds, which I think is uh, you know, the kind of motivation in, I mean, I'm not sure it's a modern principle, but they, they, Hamilton sees it. I think Aristotle would not say that the noblest mind is ruled by passion at all. So I'll just, maybe I'll make the final, I mean, you mentioned fair and fair, but I don't think those are entirely unrelated, are they? I mean, the just and the beautiful may not be identical. They may not always go together. They may be in some tension with one another, but they're not entirely opposed to one another, I think, so... That would uh, suggest that fair and the two kinds of fairness are, as I say, can can perhaps at least coexist um, at times. Um, well, let's. I, I think we're at time to end, so we will end uh, on behalf of the Hoover Institution and the Foundation for the Government. Thank you all for coming. Thank the first panelists. Thank Professor Mansfield. Buy the book.